This epic story starts with a normal high school girl waking up in the morning and taking a shower. After that, she gets prepared for school. There, she is greeted by most students, however, she sees the one she despises, Kageno. She greets him and he greets her back, but calls her Nishimura. She tells MC that her name isn't Nishimura. MC apologizes, stating he was pretty good at remembering named NPCs, but lately hasn't got much sleep and calls her Nishitani. She gets annoyed and corrects him, revealing her actual name, but MC again gets it wrong and calls her Nishimura as he leaves. Akanen notes that she doesn't despise him for getting her name wrong, but for never looking at her, and even when his eyes are facing her direction, they seem to be looking at a somewhere far off place. When Akane was in middle school, she had to take a break from show business due to a scandal. Since then, she has been hiding behind a mask. She plays the teacher's pet so that the teachers like her. She also plays the role of the popular girl so that every student in the school like her. After school, she calls her driver but he doesn't pick up as he was attacked by some men. Since he didn't come to pick her up, Akane is forced to head home walking, which is her first time doing so since the incident after middle school. On her way, she is kidnapped by the men that beat the driver. While she loses consciousness, she sees MC in the shadows. Later, Akane wakes up tied in some warehouse. The kidnapper tells her the daughter of Nishino Zebatsu shouldn't walk alone at night. The other kidnapper then tells her she just needs to stay still, and once they get the ransom, she will be freed. Outside, MC observes the kidnapper and changes his clothes. He also puts on a mask. A kidnapper wants to have some fun with her and notes how this should be her second kidnapping and that the first time was some stalker. MC then comes down from the roof window, saying he is the stylish whatever slayer. The kidnapper pulls out a gun, but MC throws a piece of glass, injuring his arm and disarming him. He then charges the guy and throws him to the ground and smashes his face. The other kidnapper sees that MC isn't an ordinary man and states he was bored doing those kidnappings with amateurs. He notes he is a former military and takes out a knife. Then using crowbars, MC manages to disarm the man, but still gets overwhelmed. He then decides to get serious and show him the potential he found in crowbars when he fought bikers. The man then realizes he is Balaclava Berserker, a man who has been fighting the bikers with crowbars. MC notes that the bikers started wearing helmets, so he had to stop using the crowbars like Tonfa, and instead use them as regular clubs. MC then proceeds to destroy him by breaking his legs and beats him up. He then frees Akana and tells her to be more careful next time. Akana then calls the police and her father uses his connections to make the case not go public. The next day, Akana goes to school. She sees Kageno and greets him and he greets her back, calling her Nishino. She is ready to correct him, but realizes he got her name right and this time feels he is looking at her. She then felt he is also living a life behind a mask. The next morning, the news reported that Minoru Kagano got hit by a truck and didn't survive. Kagano doesn't remember since when, but he always dreamed of being a hero. He spent his days in training, while at school he was a background character. He reached a point where he can beat up some guys, but when surrounded by armed men, he doesn't stand a chance. If he becomes the best martial artist in the world, he may be able to beat those men too, but he still won't be able to do anything about a missile. Kagano wants to overcome those limits. After being hit by a truck, Kageno is reborn in a new world. He forms an organization and with his squad, they are about to start an operation. He also had obtained a new power magic. Kageno wants to be the one who operates from the shadows, showing everyone their greatness, the eminence in shadow. Alpha reports to Sid, telling him that everything he said is true and that she found mentions in ancient texts of what they believe is the cult of Diablos. After dying in a car incident, Minoru Kageno gets reborn as the son of Baron Kageno, an aristocrat living out in the boonies. He quickly understands the situation and feels there is magic in the air. The Kageno family has been making dark knights who can enhance their abilities using magic. The family has big hopes for Clara Kageno. She is our MC's older sister, who is quite talented. MC grows up staying as a background character and doesn't draw any attention to him. However, at night he comes out and fights bandits. Using his slime sword, he easily kills the bandits while having fun and takes their gold. He then finds a cage with a weird looking rotting creature. He realizes that it's possession magic and the magical output of that creature is overloaded. He takes an interest in it and takes it home where he shoots it with magic and does other experiments on it. After a month, he finally manages to contain the magical overload. 
The creature then returns to its normal form, a young beautiful elf. Wondering what to do, Sid decides to put on an act. As the elf awakens, Sid states he broke her curse that has been put on Hero's descendants. He shows her a fiction book about three heroes who defeated Diablos and tells her it's actually a true story, and in his dying breath, the demon puts a curse on them. He then explains that the cult of Diablos is plotting to revive the demon. While most people had forgotten about Diablos, Sid works in the shadows to stop the cult. He introduces himself as Shadow He who lurks in the shadow and hunts the shadows. Sid asks her if she would join him and since having lost everything, she agrees. She then goes on to say how they need to find more hero descendants to expand their organization. Sid agrees with the flow, understanding zero shit and names their organization the Shadow Garden. He also names the blonde girl Alpha. Fast forwarding a bit, three years have already passed and Sid is now 13 years old. He practices with his sister and while he can defeat her easily, he acts weak and lets her defeat him. Claire is now 15 years old and at that age, the nobles start attending the Midgar Academy for Dark Nights. On the day Claire had to depart for the academy, she disappeared and her room is a mess. In those three years, Alpha had collected more members for their organization. Sid asks Beta where is Alpha and Beta explains she is looking for clues to finding Claire. Beta explains that Claire is likely still alive and was kidnapped by a high-ranking member belonging to the cult of Diablos. The cult probably believes that Claire is one of the hero's descendants. Beta takes out a map and states they have few known hideouts, but don't know in which one they keep Claire. Sid makes a slime knife and throws it at the map. He ends up missing the hideout but states they will find his sister there. Beta then figures out that the cryptograms are a bluff, and there is actually a secret hideout at the location pointed out by Sid. He then tells her to contact the Seven Shadows. At the hideout, Viscount Grease is holding Claire chained with magic sealing chains. He comments her father taught her good on how to fight, but Claire explains she learned all by fighting her brother. Grease then asks if he healed her when she showed signs of possession, but Claire denies it, stating there is no way he can heal her. Grease notes that for just in case, they need to look into her brother too. At that moment, Claire breaks one of the chains and injures her right arm to free herself. She threatens to kill him and his family, if they ever touch her brother. Grease then knocks her out. Then a man comes informing him, there has been a break-in. Grease's men are easily cut to pieces by the Seven Shadows. Facing them, Alpha states they are Shadow Garden. Their mission is to annihilate the cult of Diablos. Grease wonders how they know about it, since it's secretly hidden from the world. He attacks Alpha, but she gets injured while blocking his attacks. She states how they won't kill him until they get answers from him. Seeing he is overwhelmed, Grease takes a pill to boost his magic. He manages to push away Alpha and then breaks the floor to run. Alpha then tells the girls there is no need to chase him, as Shadow is after him, which is why they split up. Meanwhile, MC is lost and reacts all dumb, saying he doesn't know where the girls went. While walking around the tunnels, he encounters Grease. Noticing our MC, he attacks him right away but MC easily blocks his attack. MC says that he has more magic power than Alpha, but doesn't know how to use it. He carefully gives him few lessons. As he is done, MC gets serious and starts cutting him, causing Grease to wonder if he ever was that overwhelmed in battle before. He tells MC no matter how strong he is, the darkness in the world is much deeper, but MC acts badass by saying he will just dive deeper. Grease takes more pills and buffs himself even more, wanting to show MC that people are worthless, fragile, and powerless. MC manages to block his attacks and then using a large amount of magic, he cuts down Grease. As Grease falls, he notes he was powerless against the darkness, but maybe not Shadow. The next day, Claire returns home in a bad mood. Her wounds heal overnight and she departs for the academy. Sid is eager to go to the academy himself, but if fine as he has two more years and needs to give the girls some work. However, Alpha tells him it's time they leave him, which leaves him shocked. Alpha told Sid that the Cult of Diablos is an enormous organization that runs on a global scale, so in order to fight it, they needed to split up and expand their territory. Sid feels that's just a nice way of them telling him that they are now grown up, want their freedom, and don't want to continue playing this fighting the cult game. When Sid turns 15, he enrolls in the same school as his sister in the royal capital of Migger Kingdom. Seven months into his academy life, Sid continues to live as a background character and makes friends with Skel Atoll and Potato, other bottom-of-the-pile nobles like him. While heading to school, Skel and Poe remind Sid 
that as he scored the worst on the test, his penalty is to confess to the most sought-after girl in school and suffer her rejection. Arriving at school, they see the girl in question, Princess Alexia Midgar, who rejects another guy's confession. However, Sid is excited about it wanting to experience such confession as a background character. That evening, he goes to confess to Alexia by acting, all cringe and muttery. He feels he has done a great job as a background character on the confession. However, to his surprise, she accepts stating, she was actually waiting for someone like him. The rumors quickly spread and people start to wonder who is Sid, and what's so great about him. They wonder why she accepted a guy like him. Skell and Poe wonder if they also had a chance since MC is like them. She then joins them at lunch, which surprises other students as that's the lower nobility section. She gets served lots of food and comments she can't eat at all. MC then gladly starts eating her food in an attempt to make her dump him. She heard that he is studying royal bush and fencing and wants to practice together. Sid states he is in the lowest sections, but Alexia explains she put a good word for him and she got him in section one. Later, Sid joins section one team where their advisor is Zenon Griffey, the official royal fencing instructor. Sid practices with Alexia and notices that her attacks never land. She is slow and doesn't use much magic, but realizes it's because the practice is to review their strokes and counterstrokes. While he finds her technique good, he thinks it's bland. After the practice, Alexia states he has a good fencing style, but hates it as it feels like she is looking at herself. Alexia tells Zenon that she is Sid's girlfriend now, who tells her that won't change the fact that she is betrothed to him, even if it's still a public secret. Sid then realizes what is going on. After that, Sid asks Alexia if she just wanted someone to help her get out of the engagement with Zenon, and chose a low-class aristocrat, whom she could easily control. As she confirms, Sid states he doesn't want more attention and isn't interested in being mixed up in her problems. Alexia tells him that's a bit cold of him, as she knows he fake confessed to her, since his friends easily told her everything. She tells him if the student body learns she toyed with her heart, they'll pretty much kill him. She wants to continue the boyfriend act, until Zenon gives up. MC notes that he may not give up as it's clear he is out of her league. She understands, but still wants some time. Then she will deal with it somehow. Alexia takes out and throws a gold coin. Staring at it, Sid asks her if he looks like a tight that can be brought. Alexia confirms, and so does Sid. As she throws another coin, he jumps and get it with his mouth. While acting like a dog, Sid notes that his parents' allowance isn't enough to carry his eminence in shadow operation and can't let this chance slip up. Sid decides to continue being her boyfriend and is glad that students can now focus on she having a boyfriend, not him which lets him being the background boyfriend character. In public, Alexia is prudent, but behind the scenes, she constantly badmouths Zenon. Sid decides to not argue with her and agrees to everything she says. Sid wonders what is so bad about Zenon, and she states it's easy to pretend to be nice. She also judges people by their flaws. Zenon doesn't have any, which is not normal for a human. While riding a train, Alexia tells Sid that he has the fencing basics, but nothing more than that, yet she can't take her eyes off NC. MC wonders what's with her today as her fencing was unusually sloppy. The lover girl reveals that she always wanted to be as good as her sister, but she didn't have what her sister had and always solo hard worked. They ended up calling Alexia the fencing ordinaire. Unfortunately, MC fencing is ordinary like hers. MC states he doesn't find it unfortunate and likes her fencing. Alexia reveals that her sister told her the same thing after she suffered a humiliating defeat at Bushin Festival but her sister couldn't understand how pathetic Alexia was feeling. Sid explains that he isn't a great person and wouldn't care if someone kills a million people, as there are things that people find worthless. To him, they are the most precious things in life he can have, which is why he likes her fencing style. Alexia draws her sword and asks him what he means by that. Sid states he gets pissed off when people diss the things he likes. The train stops and Alexia leaves, telling Sid goodbye. He guesses how this is finally the end of his unwanted relationship. Skell and Poe then come to apologize to Sid for telling everything, as Alexia threatened them. They wonder how far he got with her while dating her for two weeks. Sid states he didn't get anywhere, which annoys them as they state they would have gone all the way deep. The next day at the school gate, Zenon and two other men stop Sid and his friends. Zenon states Sid should know that Alexia didn't return to her dorm last night, and they are investigating it as a potential kidnapping. And since Sid was the last person seen with her, 
he is their main suspect. He stays silent and feels dumb. As he sees more knights surround him, Sid surrenders and realizes how he got mixed up in a troublesome situation. Alexia wakes up chained in a cell. She notices a humanoid monster next to her cell. A man then shows up, excited to get the so-called royal blood from her. She questions, what is he going to be doing with her blood, and the man states that they will revive demons in the modern world. Meanwhile, Sid is being beaten since they took him as a fake prisoner. He gets excited as he finds this as a classic minor character interrogation. And he goes with the act properly, so they don't outshine him. He starts yelling that he doesn't know anything to continue his act, which satisfies him a lot. Later, Zenon meets with Iris and states that he feels responsible for Alexia's kidnapping and should take action. Iris wonders if Sid could have really kidnapped her. Zenon states there are evidences, but with his skill level, he shouldn't have been able to kidnap Alexia. She then feels regretful that she couldn't do as much as her big sister. After that, since it's been already five days, they decide to release him. But on his way, they send spies to keep track of him. As he leaves the train, Alpha shows up and takes care of those men. And Sid goes home safely like a background character. Alpha shows up from the window in a dazzling way and explains how their organization is growing. They also have been gaining more information about the cult. Sid notes to himself that the girls are visiting him from time to time and living normal lives. But he is happy that they still play his game and visit him. Alpha explains that Alexia was kidnapped by the cult due to her blood and they are investigating it. She asks him if he wants her to dispose of those rowdy knights that interrogated him. Sid says they were just doing their job as a knight. Before leaving, Alpha also tells him that Delta is here and she has been missing him. Sid then sets his eminence in Shadow Room, where he takes out an expensive wine, masterpiece paintings, an antique lamp, and lots of other stuff. He then drinks wine while waiting. A bit later, Beta shows up. He tells her the time has come. Beta gets excited upon hearing those cringy words. She explains they are ready and under Alpha's orders, they have gathered all available personnel in the capital. It's about 114 girls. Hearing that number surprises Sid. Beta explains that they plan to launch simultaneous attacks on all sect hideouts. As she explains the girl roles, Sid stops her, giving her a letter and stating that he will be taking Delta's spot. Sid leaves his place and the two knights that interrogated him wait for him and throw him Alexia's boot to frame him and kill him. Sid then drops the bodies of the two men that were following him. He then proceeds to massacre those knights while laughing. Beta is seen around the corner noting his words. The Shadow Garden then starts their attack. The doctor rushes to Alexia, stating that they are coming. She tries to tell him that the knights don't kill without a reason, but he doesn't seem to be afraid of the knights. He tells her how he made a prototype and it should work even on a failed result as the one next to Alexia's room. As he injects the disfigured creature, it becomes much larger and stronger and then instantly kills the man. But to Alexia's surprise, the monster suddenly cuts her chains, which freed her from imprisonment. A few minutes later, after picking up a sword, Alexia looks for an exit. He encounters Zenon, who explains that this is his facility and that he was funding the doctors to run this hideous research. She was actually relieved hearing that, as she always felt he wasn't right in the head. Zenon explains that with her blood and his research, he will be guaranteed the twelfth seat in the Knights of the Rounds, the highest ranking knights in the order. He disses her saying how she is weaker than her sister, which infuriates her. Alexia then attacks him, but she is no match for Zenon. He easily disarms her by countering. Sid then appears and introduces himself as Shadow. As Shadow introduces himself, Zenon recognizes him as the one who has been going after the cult, but notes he is a coward as he has been targeting only bases without the cult's core members. He is now facing the core member of future 12th seats. As Zenon attacks MC, he moves behind him, placing himself between Zenon and Alexia, and mocks Zenon. Asking him where is this core member he spoke of? The monster had escaped above ground. After evacuating the citizens, the knight faces it, but their attacks are ineffective as the monster just heals. Iris comes and inflicts a more serious wound on the monster, but it heals that too. She decides to get more serious and cuts the monster's arm. However, the monster easily regenerates it. Seeing that, Iris decides to cut it into small pieces so that it won't be able to regenerate. After inflicting several wounds, Alpha comes and states she is just making her suffer. Alpha states she knows the monster's pain and suffering, so she will put an end to it. 
Alpha then attacks the monster, curing it and returning it to her original human form, a young girl. Alpha sees a pendant on her, revealing that she is Milia, Greece's daughter. Alpha then tells Iris that they are Shadow Garden and she should just stay back and enjoy the show as they deal with this situation. Zenon decides to get more serious and uses more magical power, but is still easily overwhelmed by Shadow. Zenon gets angry and continues to attack Shadow, who easily blocks his attacks. Seeing the fight, Alexia is amazed by Shadow and sees that at its core, his swordplay is ordinary. It's like her ideal swordplay she dreamed of when she was young. However, she could never become stronger or equally strong as her sister. Shadow slashes Zenon, who gets angry and asks him why is he hiding his identity if he is that strong. Shadow states they are Shadow Garden and they hunt in the shadows, which is the sole purpose of their existence. Annoyed, Zenon takes out some red pills and explains that by taking them, he will awaken a new nature beyond human limitations and if an ordinary person takes them, he will be overwhelmed by their tremendous power and die. Zanon then takes the pills and transforms, stating he is the third awakened. Having far more destructive power than before, Zenon attacks Shadow, however, he easily blocks him once again. As Shadow overwhelms Zenon, he tells him that there is no road to all mightiness if you use borrowed power. He then sets a magic circle around Zenon, which surprises him with how powerful it is. Shadow states there once was a man who wanted to withstand a nuclear bomb. The man then developed his muscles, honed his mind, and perfected his skills. However, there were still heights he could not attain. In time, Shadow realized that if he don't want to be vaporized by a nuclear bomb, he needs to become nuclear himself. Zenon thinks he is crazy and tries slashing him, but his sword breaks as it hits Shadow. Shadow then tells him to witness his almightiness as he uses his almighty power. He then chants, I am atomic. A huge explosion then occurs, leaving a large crater in the middle of the city. Alexia finds herself unharmed in the middle of the crater. He picks a sword and starts practicing her fencing. Iris sees her and comes down, hugging her and states she is glad that she is alive. Sometime after that, Alexia returns to school and she tells Sid what actually happened. She thanks him for liking her fencing and tells him that she also finally learned to like it. They were pretending to be a couple, but now Zenon is dead. Alexia wonders if Sid wants to keep the relationship going, but Sid refuses. That shocks Alexia, who then attacks him. The spot where they talked became known as people found a large amount of blood there, but no bodies or missing people were found or reported. As a result, in time the case became known as one of the school's seven mysteries, the bodiless murder. The Shadow Garden girls are excited about how powerful Shadow is and how all of their enemies will one day vanish from his light, just like Zenon. They have a report from Zeta, who found the target and will be investigating. Ida's research is also going smoothly. However, they have one issue, someone has been pretending to be from Shadow Garden and delivering justice. They are covering their tracks well, but Gamma is sure they will catch them. Iris now knows about the cult and Shadow Garden. She knows that Zenon was adherent to the cult, and because of that she doesn't trust the Knight's Order. She trusts Glenn and Marco, and decides to form a new investigation team with them. Iris reveals they have found an item, but need to find someone who can decipher its functions. Meanwhile, while reading and carrying books, Sherry Barnett bumps into Sid, who is covered in blood from Alexia's attack. Skell and Poe wonder how things went with Alexia, and if Sid got at least a kiss. However, Sid tells them that they broke up and haven't done anything. Disappointed, Skell tells him that he knows a place that sells all kinds of good stuff, including something called chocolate, which they can use to give to girls and win them. As Skell and Poe are too excited, Sid accepts as he is also curious to see what this world calls chocolate. Iris shows an artifact they found in the hideout of the cult, however as they can't decipher it, she asks Sherry Barnett, the most brilliant mind in the kingdom, if she can decipher it. Her father, Lutheran, encourages Sherry to do it. Sherry accepts and Iris decides to assign the Crimson Order to keep watch on them. Lutheran hears that's the new Knight Order that Iris formed and Iris confirms and that it's a small order, but it is made by people she trusts. Alexia also wishes to help and Iris accepts. Sid, Skell, and Poe go to the store, but the line is so big that they have to wait 80 minutes for their turns. Poe is worried as a killer is going around at night. Sid tries to ask about the killer, but then, a worker from the store asks Sid if he can come with her and answer some survey. As Sid enters the store, he feels it's like a department store from his old world, as many things remind him of his world that he hasn't seen elsewhere in this world. 
Sid is eventually taken to a throne room in a house above the store building. Sid then sees Gamma next to the throne and figures it in her store. She confirms and states she recreated it from the wisdom Sid shared with them. Sid recalls telling the girls random stuff and notes that Gamma was the smartest among the girls, but also lacks athleticism. In that moment, Gamma ends up falling the stairs. Gamma invites Sid to sit on the throne, and as he sits, he feels like a king. He congratulates her and creates something like fireworks as her reward, which excites her as the light reminds her of the light he used to save her. Sid guesses she is making money and Gamma confirms, stating she has several franchises around the cities and that they even use mail orders for remote areas. She shows him she has one million zini at her immediate disposal. Hearing that, Sid is shocked. Gamma guesses Sid game due to the incidents and the killer states he is from Shadow Garden. They are investigating him already and promise Sid that they will put an end to his deeds. Sid had no idea, but decides to play along and states he has some idea who it may be as he recalls his incident with Alexia. Gamma introduces Nu, their newest member of the numbers, and explains that Alpha acknowledged her skill. Sid tells her that he will call her if he needs her. He then tells Gamma that he wants to purchase three chocolates of the cheapest, but Gamma states she will give him chocolate for free from the highest quality. Sid gets happy and while laughing with Gamma, he also steals one coin. Sid and his friends then rush heading home. Sid guesses that Alexia went crazy and started killing people. Hearing something, he stops and tells his friends that he needs to poop right away and tells them to go before they see him shit himself. Skill and Poe believe that is very manly and state they won't forget him and will never tell anyone about it. Sid then goes into the back alley where he heard Alexia fighting but is surprised to see her fighting some men who claim to be from Shadow Garden. They manage to injure her, but Sid shows up as Shadow and kills one of the men, and tells the others that they will also pay for impersonating Shadow Garden. The men run, and Alexia asks Shadow why is he fighting, but he tells her to stay out of it. Shadow follows the men and kills one of them. Nu then shows up and congratulates Shadow on finding them that fast and requests that he leaves the rest to her, as she will get information from the remaining man. Shadow agrees and leaves. Nu then cuts the man's arm disarming him. He states she isn't as forgiving as Shadow. Elsewhere, a man informs a knight that he lost contact with the puppets. The knight states it's fine as they located the item they need and their priority is retrieving it. Alexia tells Iris that the killer was impersonating Shadow Garden. Alexia adds that Shadow is fighting the cult and Iris hopes that they will learn something more when the artifact gets deciphered. Alexia then asks her who she thinks is the real enemy, Shadow Garden or the cult. Iris states it's both and that she won't allow anyone to wreak havoc in the kingdom. The next day on the train for school, rumors spread that Sid had shit his pants. Skell and Poe are nervous and ask Sid if he got the chocolate from yesterday. At school, Skell gives chocolate to an upper class woman, but the person she is engaged to shows up and catches Skell. He then takes him somewhere to beat him up. Poe and MC leave silently, as they don't want to follow in Scale's footsteps and die like him. Later, as MC's other friend approaches a random girl, she recognizes him as her stalker and yells. Sid decides to give his chocolate to the first girl he sees and be over with his background character moment. Sherry then sits next to him, and he decides to randomly give her the chocolate and leaves like a perfect background character. Sherry recognizes Sid from the other day. Later in her room, she wonders what is the chocolate for. Her father then comes in and recognizes his chocolate, and explains how it's been popular lately. Sherry tells him that a boy gave it to her and her father guesses it's a present and it must have been love at first sight. He wonders what she will tell him as he must be waiting for an answer. He also tells her that study and research are important, but she also needs to learn how to interact with others. He starts to cot, but states he has been feeling better lately and is lucky to have such a good daughter. Sherry states she is the lucky one as he adopted her. Sherry thinks of what her father told her, love at first sight. She finally decides to try the chocolate and finds it really sweet. New disguises as a student and approaches Sid at school. She tells him that the man they caught had a powerful brainwashing that broke his mind and wasn't able to obtain any information from him. While New explains things, Sid is distracted and is thinking about how Skell ended up signing him for a fencing tournament. New explains that they confirmed the presence of a named first child in the royal capital, Rex, the game of betrayal. New says that first child are those who maintained their sense of self despite being one of the children. Sid states he needs some time to think and leaves. At the tournament, Claire easily wins her fight. 
Next up is the student council president Rose Oriana versus Sid. He decides to show his 48 techniques he mastered. As their fight start, Sid lets himself get hit and coughs fake blood, showing his secret background character technique spinning drill fall, bloody tornado, an unsightly defeat in the first round at the hands of an indisputable champion. The judge is about to give the win to Oriana, but Sid stops him. He continues to cough fake blood, but wishes to continue as he has 47 other techniques to show off. Sid continues to get one-shotted, but stands after each hit wanting the fight to continue. Oriana is surprised by his determination and decides to get serious. As she attacks, the judge jumps in and saves Sid, announcing the end of the fight and Oriana as the winner. The judge states it's too dangerous for Sid to continue as he lost a lot of blood. Sid protests and wants to continue as he still has 33 techniques to show off, but he is carried out. After the fight, Sid hopes he will still get a chance to show the remaining of his techniques. He is then approached by Sherry, who explains she watched his fight and he was incredible as he kept standing up. She then gives him cookies she baked as thanks and suggests they can start as friends. Sid isn't sure why she gave him cookies and what she means by starting as friends, but he accepts. She tells her father that they are going to be friends and he joins them. Sid recognizes him as an important person and notes that if he wishes to remain as obscure as possible, he shouldn't be having a contact with him. After some small talk, he uses his injuries as an excuse to leave. Sherry is thinking about Sid and wonders if she should visit him since they are friends. She decides to go and talk with Alexia, who guesses that she is there to talk about the artifact but Sherry denies it. Nervous, Sherry says she heard that Alexia is in a relationship with Sid and wonders if it's true. Alexia states they broke up, and in reality, they weren't dating, but pretending to be a couple for specific reasons. Sherry gets quite happy to hear that, and states she became friends with Sid the other day. She wasn't able to concentrate on her research, but now it is glad to learn they aren't together. Sherry leaves happy, but Alexia gets frustrated. After five days, Sid returns to school and feels that everyone is a bit nicer to him than usual. Oriana then comes to explain the election to fill the vacancy on the student council. At the same time, a masked knight from the cult decides to start their plan. He creates a barrier around the school, but seemingly only Sid notices it. Alexia returns to school, but sees the gate is closed and the guard is dead. Sid notices he can't use his magic. Some men then come into the room claiming to be from Shadow Garden and explaining that they are taking over the academy. Oriana decides to fight them, but realizes she can't use magic. The fake Shadow Garden members are able to use magic and one of them easily breaks Oriana's sword. He then attempts to kill her, but Sid rushes in and pushes her away while taking the hit and then falls to the ground covered in blood. As terrorists attack the academy, Sid gets excited, but seeing that they are about to kill Rose, he jumps in stating to himself that as a background character, each just role to be first killed by them. Rose wonders why he gave his life away to save her, but then guesses he loved her, which explains why he was motivated to keep standing when he fought her and why he gave his life. The terrorists then move all the students to the auditorium. Sid starts hitting his heart and as it starts beating again, he wakes up. He reveals it was his secret technique where he stops his heart for 10 minutes, but maintains regular blood flow to his brain. His magic is still obstructed, but he can use it if he narrows it to threads. Rex enters Sherry's room. He states he is from Shadow Garden, but then wonders if it was Shadow Guardian. He explains his job is to retrieve the artifact, and once he is done, he is allowed to wreak as much havoc as he wants. Rex then sees the artifact in Sherry's hands, but as he attacks her, Glenn stops him. Rex is impressed he managed to do it without magic, and Rex explains it's easy when his opponent is weaker. While Glenn and Marco keep the terrorists busy, they let Sherry run away. Sid observes the movement of the terrorists and is quite excited about the whole situation. He is annoyed they are all black as they aren't doing it properly. He decides to show up at night and snipes quite a few of them so that he makes his grand appearances easier. He notices a girl running and almost begging to be captured and realizes she is Sherry. While she moves around, Sid ends up taking out several terrorists, saving her from being captured or detected. Sherry ends up tripping on the stairs and falls, but Sid captures her. He has several things to tell her, but first asks her to remove her noisy slippers. Before reaching her father's room, Sid ends up taking out a few more terrorists. Sherry finds the book she was looking for and explains that the artifact Eye of Averis is the one that blocks their magic. The artifact absorbs and stores the magic from any user, but it can be programmed to ignore some magical frequencies. 
Sherry guesses it can absorb magical traces that are too small to detect or powerful spells that exceed its capacity. However, there isn't a human capable of doing the second. Once the artifact has absorbed all it can absorb, it will release all the stored energy at once. Since all the students are in the auditorium, Sherry guesses that the artifact is somewhere nearby, and if it releases all the energy it will blow up and kill all in the auditorium. Because of that, Sherry states her father didn't publish his findings and gave the artifact to the government for safekeeping. Sherry also explains that the artifact she was researching is used to control the Eye of Averis and store the energy for the long term. Sherry plans on using the basements and reaching the auditorium. Once she is close to the Eye of Averis, she will activate this artifact and stop the Eye of Averis from exploding. However, she left all the tools needed to fine-tune this artifact in her room. Sid then states he will get them for her and leaves her. Rex reports to the cult knight that some of their men had been taken out by someone skilled in guesses that Shadow Garden is here. As Rex still hasn't obtained the artifact, the cult knight threatens him to go and find it or he will kill him. The cult knight notes that once his ambitions are realized, he will be reinstated in the Knights of Rounds. Rex is walking with four men, but in an instant he ends up losing them, as Sid then hits him before Rex manages to react. Thinking Sid is fast due to an artifact, Rex creates a net around himself, stating that no matter how fast Sid is, the moment he gets caught in his net he will know. He then turns around and sees that Sid is already inside his net. Sid proceeds to attack Rex and eventually takes him to a classroom with each seat taken by a dead terrorist. As Sid attacks Rex again, he notes that Rex is awesome. Meanwhile, Nu finds the dead body of Glenn and Marco, who is still alive but knocked out. A moment later, Sid arrives and starts looking for Sherry's tools. Nu explains that Marco was her betrothed. She then explains that Shadow Garden had infiltrated the academy and are awaiting orders. However, she explains that not being able to use magic is a risk and only the Seven Shadows can do it. Currently, only Gamma is in the capital, but this type of mission isn't her fort. Even Nu herself can only use about half of her power right now. As she continues her report, Sid asks her to help him find some items. After obtaining all the tools, Sid explains he needed them to fine-tune an artifact and that the Eye of Averis is absorbing their magic. Once they fine-tune the other artifact, they can neutralize the Eve of Averis. Sid then brings the tools to Sherry, who starts fine-tuning the artifact. Nu then decides to leave after she gives Marco a slight wound on his neck. Without magic, Iris is unable to do anything and is forced to stay outside the academy. Meanwhile, Sherry fine-tunes the artifact and is ready to head into the tunnels. But before they step into them, Sherry recalls seeing the death of her mother as a child. Lutheran comforted her, stating her mother was a great researcher and offered to take and raise Sherry. As Lutheran supported her mother's research, Sherry is determined to repay him. Sid leaves Sherry's head into the tunnels alone. The cult knight wonders why is Rex taking that long. Some of the terrorists then start shooting the students for fun. But Rose tells the students to not do anything as without magic they won't stand a chance. Sherry reaches the auditorium and sees the cult knight holding the Eye of Averis. She activates her artifact and disables the magic blocking field. At that moment, Rose attacks one of the terrorists, stating their magic is back and the students start fighting back. As the fight starts, Sid comes from the roof with other Shadow Garden members and engages the terrorists. The cult knight leaves, but activates a system that causes the auditorium and the rest of the school to burst into flames. Iris finally makes a move, but sees the terrorists are dead and the students are outside and okay. She asks Rose what happened and Rose explains that once their magic was back an organization called Shadow Garden came and killed the terrorists, who were also calling themselves Shadow Garden. Sherry couldn't see her father at the auditorium and wondered where is he as she tries to escape the fire. The cult knight burns some books. Sid appears and wonders why Lutheran is dressed like that. The cult knight removes his helmet, revealing he is indeed Lutheran, and wonders how Sid knows that. But Sid states it was obvious from the moment he saw him. Sid wonders why he did this. Lutheran explains that once he reached the top of the sword fighting world, but soon he became sick. He easily lost the glory he fought hard to attain and started searching for a way to cure his disease and found potential in a certain artifact. He funded Sherry's mother's research and eventually found the artifact he longed for. However, Sherry's mother stated the Eye of Averis was dangerous and wanted to give it to the government for safekeeping. Lutheran then killed Sherry's mother. Sherry didn't see him there and never realized it and continued her mother's research. Sid wonders if Lutheran used Sherry for his selfish reasons and he confirmed. 
Sid then explains he doesn't care for Sherry and her mother, but suggests they start before someone else comes. Sid and Lutheran then face each other, but in an instant Lutheran cuts Sid and he falls through the window. A moment later, Shadow comes. Having experience with strong fighters, Lutheran immediately notes that he knows he is at a disadvantage against Shadow. Not wanting to waste time, he pulls out the Eye of Avaris and the Control Unit Artifact and explains that when you combine them, their true value shows. As he does, he starts overflowing with magical energy and feels reborn. Lutheran then starts attacking Shadow, however, Shadow easily blocks his attacks without even moving from his spot. Lutheran decides to get serious and lunges at Shadow, but he ends up cut by him. Angered, Lutheran still continues to attack Shadow and explains that he made sure Shadow Garden are blamed for all of this and they will be hunted by everyone. Shadow finds that hilarious and explains that something as small as this won't end his organization, which isn't good or evil, but walks on its own path. Shadow is fine taking all the guilt for all crimes, but states that won't change anything and they will continue to do what they must. Shadow then disarms Lutheran and proceeds to stab his limbs. He then recalls how Lutheran stated he killed Sherry's mother and stabbed him the same way and kills him. At that moment, Sherry arrives and sees her dead father and starts crying over his body. Shadow notes it's better if he doesn't tell her about her mother and just leaves. Shadow is labeled as enemy of the kingdom and is wanted for mass murder, kidnapping, arson, and robbery. Gamma tells Alpha that Shadow states he will gladly accept the guilt for all crimes, but that won't change anything and they will keep doing what they must. Alpha thought they stood for righteousness, but Shadow doesn't seem to see it that way and they must live up to his resolve. She tells Gamma to assemble the available seven shadows. The academy gets closed for an earlier summer break. Sherry thanks Sid for his help the other day. She tells him that she decided to go study abroad in Lagos. She needs to do something, but can't do it at the moment with her knowledge and also has no reason to stay here anymore. She wishes to get to know Sid better, but Sid tells her they can do that next time. Before leaving, he asks her what she needs to do. After a moment of silence, she tells him it is a secret. The summer breaks start earlier and most students decide to head home. Having nothing to do at home, Sid decides to stay in the dorm, but soon realizes he doesn't have anything to do there either. He soon receives a letter from Alpha, telling him about Lindworm. Meanwhile, Epsilon is happy to start her day. She recalls how she was saved by Shadow and obtained slime magic, which allowed her to fight two fates. Using the slime magic, she gives herself a larger bust Epsilon is remembering the distant past when Sid told her she could change her destiny. She didn't think about the cult like the other girls she watched Epsilon and her young developing bust. Beta writes a novel about how Shadow saved a woman from Zen and Griffey, but gets frustrated and decides to take some fresh air. Outside, Beta ends up meeting Epsilon, who states that lately, Shadow has been gazing at her at especially her chest. Beta doesn't want to believe it, but Epsilon states that since both have large busts, they are more aware of those sorts of glances. Epsilon then teases Beta if she had not received such gazes from Shadow. Nu then comes and tells them that they have a new directive from Alpha. Iris and Alexia visit Gamma's store to prepare for Alexia's trip to the Sacred Land as a special guest for the Goddess's trial. Alexia intends to use the opportunity and speak with the Archbishop and look into dark rumors about corruption and missing orphans. Gamma meets them and introduces herself as Luna. After explaining why they are there, Alexia requests to see some other more common items for everyday use, which won't be exactly for her, but it won't be a gift to someone either. Gamma then realizes what she means and shows her some panties and thongs. As they barely cover anything and the men like them, Iris is against it, but Alexia likes them and is confident she will look good in them. She ends up trying them and manages to convince Iris to let her buy them. After the terrorist attack, Rose hears that Sid is alive and rushes to find him. She found him covered in bandages and stated he must have survived and caused a miracle by his deep love for her. She accepts his love and as he saves her, she will give him her heart. Later Sid and Rose are traveling together in a train towards the sacred lands, with Rose clinging to him. As it will take them two more days until they arrive, Sid feels his decision to take the train as a background character was a mistake and he could have run there faster. Rose guessed that Sid was there to take on the goddess's trial. Sid is not sure but guesses that Alpha sent him for that and confirms it. Rose then explains that those who receive the goddess's blessings may even marry a princess, and if he gets it, she will speak with her father about the young brave man. She still can't tell anyone about them, but believes that if they work hard, they will have a happy future. 
but Sid believes that she is trying to recruit him into her faith and doesn't understand that he's talking about her feelings to him. Reaching Lindworm, Sid sees some keychains of a sword piercing a left demonic arm. Rose explains that according to the legend, here Olivier cut off the left arm of the demon Diablos. Somewhere within the nearby mountains are the ruins known as the Sanctuary, where it's said that Diablo's left arm is sealed. Walking around, Rose notices a signing event of the author Natsume. Rose is a big fan of hers and they line up. She explains how original her works are and how diverse and imaginary they are. Sid then checks some of her books and sees titles like Romeo e Giulietta, Asherella, Star It's a Trap Wars, One Purse, Dragon Ball, etc. He quickly realizes they are plagiarized and guesses that someone else has reincarnated like him and lines up to find out who it is. To his surprise, he sees Beta as Natsume, who uses his wisdom to get herself famous. Sid recalls that Beta told him she loves literature, so he told her a few stories from his past life. He thought she was going to use them as an inspiration to come up with a cool story, but she ended up stealing them. Beta signs a book and gives it to him, stating it contains all the details of the mission. Rose shows her book to Sid, saying that Natsume wrote her name on it. She wonders what Natsume wrote to Sid, but is surprised to see it's written in an ancient language. Rose knows a bit, but can't read it. She wonders why she wrote it like that and Sid guesses it's because it's cool. Alpha is next to Archbishop Drake's dead body and wonders what he was hiding that they even killed a man of his high status. Sid notices a man running on a rooftop and stops him. The man attacks him, but Sid easily blocks him. Epsilon then shows up and kills the man. She tells Sid that the target was eliminated by the cult's executioner. They got his henchmen, but the executioner has gone into hiding. They will be moving to plan B, Sid informs her that he will be proceeding with his own plans. One of the things Sid likes is hot springs. While in Lindworm, he goes to a hot spring. Unexpectedly, Alexia is already there too. He wonders why she is in Lindworm, and she explains she is a special guest for the goddess trial. Alexia asks Sid the same question, and Sid explains that a friend invited him, telling him that there is a fun event. Sid guesses it's the goddess trial, but wonders what exactly is the event. Alexia explains it's an annual event of a fighting ritual. Ancient warriors awaken and come from out of the sanctuary to compete against challenges. To participate you need to request it in advance, and the ancient warriors only answer the call of challengers they deem worthy. Hundreds of people try their luck each year, but only about ten actually get to battle. A few years ago, the wandering swordman Venom managed to summon Olivier, but he lost to him. Alexi explains that she isn't there to fight. She had an audit with the Archbishop, but he was murdered. If Sid joins the Crimson Knights, she can tell him more about it, but Sid isn't interested. Alexia expected Sid to be ogling her, but he wasn't even looking at her. Sid notes that he tends to not look at people at hot springs, so that they all feel more comfortable while bathing, although he would appreciate it if she stopped ogling his Excalibur. Alexia states that isn't an Excalibur, but a mere worm. Sid stands up stating that she shouldn't judge a book by its cover, and what she thought was a worm was still contained in its sheath. Alexia is shocked and Sid leaves. He slaps himself with the towel, stating when the holy sword is unsheathed, its sparkling blade is set free, and it sets off on a quest. These weird actions leaves Alexia puzzled. The new acting Archbishop Jack Nelson cancels the audit with Alexia, explaining that she was there investigating the previous Archbishop, but he is now dead and they will be investigating his death. The goddess trial is starting and Alexia is sitting next to Beta in her Natsume Kafta personality. Seeing her body, Alexia is annoyed at how like Natsume is and guesses that such types like her are the most corrupt on the inside. At the same time, Beta looks at Alexia and is annoyed by her as she used Sid and also thinks that Alexia is corrupt on the inside. The trial starts and the first contender is from Oriana Kingdom, Top Aterius. Two people from the audience sitting behind Sid explain that if a warrior is summoned, you can't leave the barrier around the arena until one of them is defeated. There is a large fee to participate and you may even get killed, but if you manage to win, you get a commemorative medal that will easily let you join any knight order in the world. Top challenges a warrior, but no one comes out. After him comes next tin line from the Midgar Knight Order, but no warriors come to face him too. Sid really wants to go with Shadow and show his skills, making people wonder who he is. Next is Steel Ain Hapnan from Lagus Vigilant Corps. However, he and many more are unable to summon anyone. Sid is getting bored and hopes the trial ends soon. 
as after all that only Anna Rosta managed to summon an ancient warrior. At that moment, the announcer reveals the next challenger is from Midgar Academy for Dark Knights, Sid Kagano. Bored, Sid states that the name sounds like a background character name, but then realizes it's his name. Sid wonders if he should come out, but if he does so, the ancient warriors are usually matched the strength of those that come out and it may be revealed he is quite strong. But if he refuses, if the academy hears that, he may get expelled. Sid decides to use option three. He creates a light above the arena to distract the people and then jumps in as Shadow. A person then appears after Shadow, shocking Jack as he didn't activate any summons. Beta recognizes the person as Aurora, the Witch of Calamity, however, there isn't much information about her due to the chaos and destruction that came after her. Beta asks Jack if he can tell her more about Aurora and falling for her feminine side. Jack agrees, but states that Shadow is unfortunate to summon her as she is the most powerful witch in all of history. Alexia disagrees, stating that if Aurora came, then Shadow's powers must have reached her level. Shadow and Aurora face each other and smile in excitement. As they start fighting, they are both enjoying their battle. Initially, Shadow is just observing and dodging all of Aurora's attacks. He really enjoys it but sees that Aurora can't use her full power and then defeats her with a single slash, noting that he wishes he could have fought her at her full strength. Shadow then leaves, shocking everyone that he won. The barrier then breaks and a magic door appears in the middle of the arena. Sid feels he has done a good job and people will talk about Shadow and forget about Sid. A magical door then appears next to him. He moves away, but the door follows him. Realizing he won't be able to escape it, he decides to enter. Another door appeared in the middle of the arena. Nelson wonders if the sanctuary responded to Shadow and explains that the door appears to those who are worthy to pass through it. The door starts opening and Nelson gives orders to remove the citizens and that the trial is canceled. He then tries to make Alexia and the rest leave, but Shadow Garden appears led by Alpha. She asks Alexia and Rose to not do anything until the door is closed and then enters the door. Epsilon had defeated Nelson's guards and states he will be coming with them inside the gate. Nelson refuses and calls his guard Venom to kill Epsilon. He attempts to cut Epsilon, but she bends to dodge the slash, but the slash ends up cutting her fake slime breasts. Not wanting to be exposed, Epsilon manages to reattach them and quickly defeats Venom. She then asks Nelson if he saw anything, but Nelson states he didn't see anything. Epsilon then grabs him and jumps into the door. Other Shadow Garden members take Beta as hostage and get in the door as well. The door starts to close, but Alexia and Rose jump in as well. Alexia and Rose are transported to where Alpha is. Alexia states she tripped and fell into the door, but Alpha doesn't care and tells her that it's fine if she also learns. Alpha explains that this is where the hero Olivia cut the Diablo's left arm and they sealed it. They came to learn more about the cult, but know that Nelson won't talk. Alpha then points at a statue of the hero Olivier, surprising the girls it's an elf woman. Alpha then shows her face, which is the same as Olivier. Nelson then realizes she was a possessed elf, but as she wasn't compatible, she should have been dead. Alpha states they know the truth behind Olivier and the possessed. They suspect that the cult goal isn't just reviving the demon and states they should proceed to see for themselves. Alpha then activates the big door and opens it. Sid enters a room where Aurora is and wonders if she summoned him. Aurora states she didn't, but notes they had a fun fight. She wonders how he got here and Sid explains a door showed up and didn't stop following him. He wonders how they can leave, but Aurora states her memory is incomplete and doesn't have any memories of ever leaving. Sid wonders about their fight and Aurora explains she just woke up there and that had never happened before. Sid then decides to head back from where he came but Aurora stops him and asks him what she is wearing and if he can help her. Sid notes it's straight jacket, but then guesses she didn't put it on for training, which is something he used to do long ago. Sid then frees her and Aurora states since they have the same goal of leaving this place, they should work together. She explains she knows how to free herself and that the sanctuary is a memory prison created from ancient battles. If they go to its center and destroy its magical core, then she will be free. She also notes that they can't use magic, and if they tried, the magic will be absorbed. Sid agrees and wonders what she will do once she is free, and Aurora states she will vanish into nothing. Alpha and the group explore the facility, and Alpha explains that this is the memories of the hero Olivia. Long ago, the cult gathered orphan children and used them for experiments. Most of the children ended up dying, and a small group of girls survived. 
Meanwhile, Sid and Aurora see a memory of young Aurora who is crying. Aurora states that to move forward, they need to end this memory. She slaps the young Aurora telling her that crying won't change anything. And soon the memory shatters. Alpha explains that Olivia was one of the compatible children and they implanted Diablo's cells in her. Nelson states they didn't have a choice as they needed power to fight the demon. Alpha proceeds explaining that once Olivia matured, she was given a mission to extract new cells from Diablo's. Olivia remained obedient believing that if she does her mission it will lead to people living in peace. But no matter how many parts she cut, the demon still lived. The cult used powerful artifacts to immobilize the left arm and gained more Diablo cells. They were able to create red pills, but its side effects were too strong and not what the cult wanted. They were able to make pills that will grant tremendous power and ageless body. Alpha points to a man in the memory and to Nelson. Alexia and the rest realize it's the same man. Nelson reveals they call the drug beads of Diablos. Alpha states it had two flaws and one of them is the hair loss. Nelson then denies it, explaining that he lost his hair due to stress as he was surrounded by idiots who made him do all the work since he has a mortal body. Alpha then reveals the first flaw is that they need to take the beads once a year or the effect will disappear. The second flaw is that they can only produce small amounts and Nelson reveals it's 12 per year. Alpha guesses that's why the Knights of Rounds contain only 12 members. They have not perfected the beads and believe the key to that is the demon's arm and the hero's descendants with Olivier's blood. She asks Nelson, calling him the 11th of the rounds, if she is correct. Nelson confirms and states he is Nelson the Avaricious. He buffs himself, but in that moment, Delta stabs him from behind and throws him down into the water. Nelson comes out of the water, breaking the memory and separating them into groups. As he faces Alpha and Delta, he multiplies himself. Delta easily cuts down Nelson's copies, but feels something is wrong. Nelson explains that the closer they are to the center of the sanctuary, the more of their power is drained. Alpha adds that at the same time, the closer is Nelson to the center, then he gains more power. Nelson was hoping to get even closer, but states this far is enough to be able to defeat them. MC and Aurora reach another memory, a battlefield with many casualties. They find young Aurora crying again. Aurora takes Sid's sword wanting to kill her to end the memory. However, as she gets close, the dead return to life and start attacking them. Aurora explains that the sanctuary is rejecting them. Sid wonders what will happen if Aurora dies and she guesses she will return to the first room where they met. Epsilon's group find a sick person, but as it goes through Epsilon, the person disappears. Epsilon then explains that it probably was a memory that reacted to them and materialized. They find an archive with information about the possessed and realize this could have happened to them too if they hadn't met Shadow. Ada had created Polaroid cameras based on information from Shadow and they take pictures of the information. Sid and Aurora are easily defeating the zombies, but as more are coming, Sid goes and kills the young Aurora, ending the memory. The two then reach the center of the sanctuary. Meanwhile, even though she is losing power, Delta is obliterating Nelson, who is shocked by her power. Aurora tells Sid that they need to destroy the magic core, which is on the other side of the door. Sid considers cutting the chains in the door, but feels the sword will break. Aurora notes there should be a key. There is a sword in front of the door, and Aurora explains it's written on it that it can cut the chains. Looking at it, Sid is sure he won't be able to pull it out from the ground. As he attempts and can't pull it out, he confirms, stating it must be drawn out by the Chosen One. Aurora then sees a sign stating that the Holy Sword can only be drawn by direct descendants. Aurora is surprised that Sid managed to decipher the magical inscription that fast. Sid states he is versed in all the standard formulas, surprising Aurora that he formalized all of the countless magical scripts and encryption patterns and memorized them. As there is no other way to open the door, the two then sit down. Watching Delta fight Nelson, Alexia wonders if she is really working with Shadow. She explains that Delta's fighting style is totally different than the sophisticated techniques that he used. As Delta defeats another close of Nelson, the memory breaks and Nelson is surprised she managed to defeat over a hundred copies without even breaking a sweat. Alpha states that even if he was able to create a hundred copies, they all still have one brain and he couldn't control them all that well. Nelson then sees a statue of Olivier and calls for Olivier to come. Olivier comes out, but at the same time, Epsilon joins Alpha and states they are done with the investigation and can leave. Nelson is surprised that they are running away, but Alpha explains their objective is to cut off the source of power and now know how the sanctuary defenses work, so they will be returning again. 
As Alpha and the rest leave, Nelson starts wondering what to say to the rest and guesses he will explain that he lured them here to expose their identities and that with Alpha's blood, they can perfect the beads. He then gets a notification that someone is in the sanctuary center. Sid asks Aurora if she wants to disappear. Aurora explains that once the core is destroyed, she will be free, and that this is a prison of memories that repeat into eternity. Sid tells her to wait a bit and soon things will work out. Sid expects the protagonist to show up and be able to pull out the sword. However, Nelson appears and Sid wonders if it's one of those scenarios where the bad guy comes first and tries to stop the protagonist. Sid sees Olivia and that she has the same face as Alpha. Nelson then sends Olivia at them and Sid goes to face her, knowing that she is quite strong. Olivia attacks Sid, who blocks her attacks, but she sends him flying everywhere and ends up breaking his sword. Nelson wonders why is Sid smiling and Sid realizes he indeed is smiling. Olivia attacks again and manages to injure Sid, who notes that a battle without conversation is tedious and that she doesn't have a heart and isn't answering any of his questions. Nelson doesn't understand what he is talking about and orders Olivia to finish him off. Aurora jumps in and asks him to stop. Even though she doesn't remember it well, she knows that no human can defeat Olivia. She tells Sid he has done enough and gave her more new memories that she could have asked for. Nelson laughs at her, noting that without magic she can't do anything, but if she agrees to help him, he will spare Sid. Sid interrupts them, stating that he doesn't need help and they shouldn't assume he will lose. Annoyed, Nelson orders Olivia to kill him and she jumps in and stabs him. Sid, who has been keeping his right eye closed for a while, opens it, stating he got them. Olivia stabs Sid, but he grabs her and bites her neck, ripping it and defeating her. Nelson wonders how is Sid still alive after being stabbed and Sid explains. If you protect your vital organs, it's easy to survive a stabbing. Nelson explains he is surprised to see Olivia getting defeated by a kid with no magic, but states she was just a copy. With the amount of magic he has in the center of the sanctuary, he summons countless copies of Olivia. Several attack Sid, but he opens his right eye and defeats them using his magic. Nelson is surprised he can use magic. Sid explains that he just tempered with the magic until it was too solid to be absorbed. It took him some time, but it's something simple. Nelson can't believe that's possible and orders the Olivia copies to kill him. Sid fights them, but as his wound continues to bleed, he notes the playtime is over. He then decides to take out all copies at the same time and start casting his ultimate spell, I am the All Range Atomic, but before he finishes one of the Olivia stabs him in the heart. However, Sid is unaffected and finishes his spell. Aurora is surprised by the amount of magic he has. The explosion obliterates all Olivia's, along with the chain door and everything else. Sid wakes up with Aurora by his side. She is surprised that he survived being stabbed in the heart and Sid explains that he used magic to move his heart to the other side. Aurora starts disappearing and confesses that she was the one who called him there. She notes she lied about other things as well, but Sid is fine with it. Aurora states that for a long time, she wanted to fade away and forget everything but now has a memory she doesn't want to forget and thanks to Sid. Sid also thanks her, stating he had a good time too. Before completely disappearing, Aurora tells Sid what to do if he ever meets the real her. Alexia, Rose, and Beta look at the aftermath of Sid's spell. Alexia feels frustrated being weak and unable to do anything. She wants to start an organization with Rose and Beta and look up for information and decide what to do. Beta states that they have no precise plan but both Rose and Beta agree to form a team. Epsilon reports to Alpha that the sanctuary has been obliterated. The Holy Sword vaporized, along with the magical core. Alpha notes that was the simplest and the most effective solution and congratulates Shadow. Epsilon also reveals that Beta is working with Alexia and may infiltrate her inner circle. Epsilon also confirms their theory that Aurora has another name, the Demon Diablos. Epsilon wonders if she should report to Shadow but Alpha states it's not needed as he knows everything. A man tries to convince Gamma to buy a prime property in Madlid and open her shopping center there. Gamma isn't sure at first, but as one of her employees tells her that they found petroleum, Gamma decides to buy every property in that street and explains she wants to redevelop the city and make it the greatest city in Valgalta Empire. Meanwhile, Alpha and the rest guess that Delta is still in the sacred land, but decide to leave her alone as she will return home when she gets cold. Alpha recalls an earlier time with Sid when they made their base of operation. She explains they need to start training the girls as they will be facing the cult and need to enhance their individual strengths. 
Alpha receives news that the Royal Chancellor Per Ashat will be visiting the royal capital of Midgar. Alexia explains to Iris that the Archbishop was part of the cult. To be able to keep the sanctuary a secret, they need some big organization and Alexia wants to investigate the divine teachings. Iris had suggested the same thing to their father, but he told them to not do anything. However, Iris feels that if she wins the Bushin Festival again, she will have more backing and support from the people, and their father will have to listen to her. Alexia wonders if the cult or shadow garden won't get involved, but Iris is sure of her sword skills. Iris wonders why Alexia went into the sanctuary as she didn't tell her to do such a thing. Alexia then acts a bit dumb and excuses himself and leaves. Iris notes to herself that her Crimson Knights lost their strongest members and probably won't be able to rebuild them. The Knight Order was supporting her, but she guesses they hated her as she took their strongest members and let them die. Iris feels she needs to win the tournament and show them a path. Rose is training however, she feels strange, and demonic possession appears on her chest. The Bunshin Festival is starting and strong warriors from all over the world start gathering. Seeing them, MC wants to also enter the tournament to act weak and all, but defeat their opponents and shock everyone how strong he is. Sid visits Gamma and asks her to help him with a disguise and enter the Bunshin Festival. Gamma wonders why, but Sid states he can't tell her. Gamma uses a special slime gel that will help him conceal his face and shape it how they want. She shows him pictures of how he wants to look and MC notes he wants to look weak. Gamma then suggests Mundane Man, a lazy dark knight with no skill. He was disowned by his noble family and died five years ago an unremarkable and unremarked death. Sid agrees and Gamma turns him into Mundane. Sid then changes his posture to look like his new character. Anna Rosa, who managed to summon an ancient warrior at the Goddess Trial, sees Sid in his mundane character. Looking at his cheap gear and sickly body, she states he is an amateur and warns him to not participate in the Bunshin Festival. Sid tells her to not judge a book by its cover and that he doesn't need her help. He walks away smiling that his disguise works. He is immediately stopped by Quentin, who tells him he needs to take her advice. Quentin explains he fought several times at Bunshin festivals and each there were weaklings like Sid, so it's better if he just go home. Sid states that he is at least stronger than Quentin. That angers Quentin who picks up Sid and punches him into an alley. Sid still states he is weak, angering more Quentin. Sid notes there are several moves he can do right now and defeat Quentin. But he has no intention of fighting yet and leaves Quentin to beat him up. Anna Rosa eventually stops Quentin. She apologizes to Sid, and while she could have stopped the fight at any moment, she decides to let Quinton beat him up so that Sid quits and doesn't get injured more at the festival. Sid leaves, which surprises Anna Rosa that he isn't hurt. She introduces herself and asks Sid about his name, and Sid reveals it's Mundane Man. Sid meets with Skell Etal, who wants to make bets and win some money in the tournament. He explains that the tournament will start with prelims and only the strongest will proceed to the main tournament. He also tells him who are the favorites. As Sid wants to show his powers only at the end, he wonders on how to defeat the stronger opponents without revealing his powers. As he leaves, he meets Rose, who explains she became friends with Alexia and Natsume Kafka. She also reveals that she is going to meet her father and he will be introducing her to her fiancé pair Asha. Rose explains that she is a princess from a land of art and culture, but she disappointed and betrayed a lot of people when she decided to become a knight. When she was young, she met a hero and was inspired by him to pick up the sword. She still refuses to abandon her ideals and that may cause her to betray more people. She asks Sid if he will keep believing in her and Sid confirms it. Sid and Skell are watching the fight. Skell explains that he is gathering data so that he can make better bets. He continues to explain how he can calculate the odds for better bets, but he will need some money to make the odds 100%. Sid ignores him but Golda Kimeki shows behind Skell, stating he finds that fascinating. Skell recognizes him and gets excited. Goldo explains he also tabulates data as it helps him win. The next match is Gonzalez Makam versus Mundane Man. Sid states he needs to take a dump and leaves. Goldo decides to analyze the fight and explains you can get a general idea of the fighter's strength before the fight. Gonzalez has a glint in his eyes and an arrogant smile, which means he is a tough fighter with a lot of experience. His battle power is 1364. On the other hand, Mundane Man is astoundingly inept, and Golda wonders how he made it to the third round. With his weak face, build and aura, his battle power is 33. 
Goldo expects Gonzalez to win in less than a second. Skell is impressed with the analyze. A second after the fight starts, Gonzalez falls. People assume that Gonzalez tripped and fell and Mundane is announced as the winner, which disappoints the crowd. Ana Rosa, however, saw how Mundane landed two quick punches on the chin. Goldo acts like he also knew this could happen and Mundane to win. He tells Skell that you can win by betting on those with higher battle power or find the weak ones and bet on their opponents. Tomorrow in the fourth match, Mundane will be facing Goldo. As Goldo leaves, Sid returns and Skell asks him to give all of his money so that he can bet on Goldo, but Sid refuses. Early in the morning, Skell knocks on Sid's door and shows him the newspaper stating that Rose stabbed her fiancé pair of Ashat and ran away. Alexia and Beta look at Rose's situation. The Oriana Kingdom wants to handle it themselves and asks the Midgar Kingdom to not get involved. Since Pair of Ashat is a son of one of the Oriana Kingdom's dukes, if they arrest Oriana, she will be in serious trouble but won't be given the death penalty due to her royal status. Alexia wants to find Rose before the Oriana Kingdom. To hear her side of the story, however, Beta guesses that Rose may not have told them anything to avoid the possibility of trouble between the kingdoms. Alexia understands that, which is why she is pissed as they are sworn allies. Beta will try gathering some more information, while Alexia decides to ask her sister for advice. After Alexia leaves, Beta guesses she may give her more info on Pair of Ashat, which will keep her occupied and not do something to get in trouble. Beta is informed that Rose made it through the sewers and is in the underground ruins right now. Sid wonders what to do, but decides to continue his role as Eminence in Shadow. Between the tournament fights, he encounters Beatrix, who smells the scent of Elf on Sid and wonders if he knows Elf. Sid confirms and Beatrix explains she is looking for the daughter of her sister and wonders if Sid had seen someone that looks like her. Sid is immediately reminded of Alpha but denies it. Beatrix then draws her sword to cut Sid's head. Sid realizes that she intends to stop before doing it and acts as a background character, shocked by what just happened. Beatrix then apologizes, stating thought he was stronger, but it seems she is mistaken. Quentin sees Anna Rosa and guesses she is here to observe mundane man, just like yesterday. He asks her what she thinks of his fight and Anna Rosa states his opponent supposedly tripped and lost. Quentin agrees, but is sure that mundane did something. He couldn't see it, but knew that Anna Rosa could explain it. Anna Rosa explains she couldn't see it all and didn't expect to see someone faster than her eyes can follow, but she did see his right hand moving, however, what followed was too fast for her to follow. Quentin then guesses he is wrong that he used some artifact and mundane didn't break the rules. Anna Rosa can't disprove that, but the two are sure that his fight with Goldo Kimeki should reveal it. Anna Rosa states that Goldo had never lost. She had to fight him three times, but Goldo simply didn't fight anyone who could possibly beat him and just forfeits. He got his nickname the Unbeaten, but he hates it and uses the Ever Victorious. As the match between Goldo and Mundane is about to begin, Quentin realizes that Anna Rosa means that either Goldo couldn't see Mundane's true strength or Mundane is cheating. The match starts and Goldo rushes at Mundane. He swings his sword, but Mundane cracks his neck and dodges it. Goldo then feels how Mundane draws his sword and cuts him, but Mundane slowly draws it and waits. Quentin is surprised he managed to dodge it, but he couldn't see what happened. Anna Rosa explains that Mudane cracked his neck and avoided the attack. Quentin can't believe such a coincidence can happen, but Anna Rosa wonders if it's not a coincidence. She barely could even see it, which isn't something a normal human should be able to do. Goldo tells Mundane that he doesn't like him. He had one in a million chance to beat him, but he didn't use it. Angry for humiliating him? Goldo decides to get serious and creates a golden dragon from his magical power. He rushes at Mundane, but Mundane sneezes and blows away the dragon in Goldo, which ends up defeating him. Anna Rosa notes that Goldo is stronger than she expected, and if he fought more often with stronger knights, he would have become quite a good one. Quentin wonders what did Mundane do, and Anna Rosa explains that if she saw right, he sneezed. The moment he did it, his sword also swung down and Goldo crashed into it. Quentin finds that unrealistic and leaves stating that if Mundane keeps winning, he will eventually face him and show him what he is made of. Anna Rosa wonders if she can move like Mundane and starts cracking her neck and sneezing. Iris gives Pair of Ashat the security plan for the Bushin Festival, but he doesn't feel it needs more security. 
Iris states he looks good and Perv agrees, saying that the news story is exaggerated and guesses that Migger worries that easily because of Alexia's kidnapping. He heard that Iris personally went looking for her, and he intends to follow the same and to have Oriana solve their family problems themselves. Mundane easily defeats Quentin. People are surprised at what is going on and can't figure out how Mundane keeps winning and if it's safe to bet for him or not. Mundane proceeds into the main tournament where he will be facing Anna Rosa. Back in the tunnel, Anna Rosa faces Mundane and tells him she misjudged his strength, but she had seen all of his moves and he must not assume he can win the same ways against her. Mundane smiles and removes one of his armor plates, which makes a hole in the ground as it falls due to its weight. Mundane explains that the weights are holding him back, but now playtime is over. Anna Rosa tells him to not assume he won already and shows him that not only he can crack his neck, Mundane moves past her wondering what she was trying to do. Sid imagines what he will do in the arena and how to reveal he is much more powerful. Skell comes knocking on his door, stating he has a plan on how to get rich fast. He shows that Rose has a reward for turning her in or giving information about her location and tries to convince Sid to work with him and find her so that he can get rich. Sid sees that his sister is visiting and decides to avoid her. He accepts Skell's proposal and uses the window to leave. While walking around town, Sid hears someone playing a piano and notes it's someone good. He recalls how in his previous life he was forced to learn to play piano. He would have rather trained for his plan to become eminence in shadow. But in time, he found out that piano is quite cool. However, as he recognizes the music, he wonders if it should exist in this world and decides to see who it was playing the piano, since it may be another reincarnated person. Sid is surprised to see it's Epsilon, who like Gamma and Beta, is using what he told her to become famous. After her performance, Sid asks if that was the Moonlight Sonata, and Epsilon confirms, saying from all the pieces he taught her, this one is her favorite. Epsilon reveals that received rewards for her music composition and gained connections with influential people. Sid realizes that she plagiarized all the music he showed her. He asks her if she knows where is Rose hiding. Epsilon states that Beta is working on that case, but she heard she is hiding in the tunnels under the royal capital. Sid thanks her and leaves, but on his way, he notices the piano and smiles. Beta shares some information with Alexia on the suspicion that Per Ashat is working with the cult. They head down the tunnels under the royal capital. Beta notes it will be hard to provide evidence for Perv's involvement with the cult. Iris had told Alexia that the King of Oriana didn't seem affected by Rose's actions. Alexia is also sure that if they continue to do nothing like her father suggests, the cult will eventually cause lots of problems for the kingdom. Alexia explains that they are heading to the underground passages as there is a chance that Rose had used them to escape. Beta notes that it's a maze down there and wonders how they can leave, but Alexia states they will just return the way they came. Rose recalls how she met her father in Perv the other day. When she saw her father the king, she knew something was wrong with him and then saw Perv and the guards cunning smiles. She drew her sword and attacked Perv, but the guards then yelled that she went mad and called for some guards. Rose believes she made a rational decision, but later realizes it wasn't. Even if she managed to kill Perv, he is just one of the cult, whose roots have already too deep within the Oriana kingdom. Perv told her to turn herself in before the Bushin festival, or he will have her father kill one of his guests. Rose now wonders if it's best to turn herself in as that way it may avoid a war. She recalls her time with Sid, but as her possession gets worse, she feels that marrying Sid and living with him would have been a dream anyway. Rose hears the Moonlight Sonata and starts following the music. Eventually, she finds Shadow who is playing on the piano. As he finishes, Rose explains she had heard the Moonlight Sonata many times, but without a doubt, this was the best performance she heard. Shadow asks her what she hopes to accomplish and Rose states she wanted to protect them, but couldn't do anything. Shadow wonders if this is her end and if she intends to put the sword down. He notes that if she has desire, he will give her power. Rose accepts as there are things she wants to do and protect. Shadow gives her power and heals her possession. He tells her that true strength lies not in one's power, but in one's way of being. After Shadow leaves, some members of the cult show up and Rose defeats them easily. Feeling the burst of magic, Alexia and Beta run towards it and find Rose. Rose states she obtained power and will follow the path she believes in. Alexia has questions, but Rose refuses to say anything, not wanting to drag Alexia into this. As Rose keeps refusing to say anything, Alexia draws her sword, 
stating she will make her talk this way. The two start fighting, but Rose defeats Alexia. Rose leaves Alexia to Beta, who states that she won't stop Rose. She notes that they are all different, but may have the same ideals and their alliance may not have been such a bad idea. In the evening, Sid returns home however, he is surprised to see his sister still waiting for him. Claire chokes Sid, explaining that she was getting more and more angry each second she was waiting for him. She is also angry that he keeps breaking his promises, but hands him a ticket to the Bushin Festival, telling him to be there and watch her as she is replacing Princess Rose. Sid goes to the Bushin Festival and finds out that the ticket his sister gave him isn't an ordinary reserved seat ticket, but a hyper VIP seating. Going to his seat, he sees Iris Midgar and assumes he got it wrong. Iris realizes he is Claire's brother and tells him he is in the correct seat, while also explaining she plans to take Claire to her personal order when she graduates. Iris also apologizes to Sid for the Zen and Griffey incident. That draws people's attention, which worries Sid as it's not normal for a background character like him. Some students ask Iris if some competitor caught her eye and Iris explains it's Ana Rosa, but Iris herself still intends to win the tournament. Sid wonders if there is someone else who caught her eye, suggesting mundane man, but the two students explain that he is just fast and lucky, with no skill. Sid gets excited that he cultivated mundane's reputation to perfection. Iris explains that there is one more person who got her eye, an elf who was also the first Bushin Festival champion, although she won't be competing. The two students realize Iris is talking about Beatrix, but note that she hasn't shown her face in public in over a decade. Sid recalls Beatrix and that he knew she was strong, but didn't knew she was famous. Sid then excuses himself and leaves. He feels the presence of someone strong, but is unable to reveal he knows it as he is currently a background character. Beatrix then shows up after him and Sid acts surprised. Beatrix wonders if he is ignoring her, but Sid denies it. <laughs> She asks him if he ran into an elf that looks like her, but Sid denies it. Beatrix hopes she can find the one she was looking for as there were a lot of people coming to the festival. Beatrix has brought too many burgers and gives one to Sid. To return the favor, Sid gives one of his burgers to her. Pear Vashat takes Sid's seat and explains that his king will be attending the festival tomorrow. He wonders about Iris's father, Klaus Midgar, and Iris explains that he will be also watching from tomorrow. Perv then sees Anna Rosa coming out of the arena. He heard that she was in the middle of a training pilgrimage and would love to invite her to work for his kingdom. Iris also states that a fencer of her caliber would be in use for her kingdom as well. Perv asks her what she thinks of Anna Rosa's opponent, Mundane Man. Iris states she sees him for the first time, but he doesn't look very strong. However, she isn't sure of Anna Rosa's win as mundane is a little unnerving and there is no uncertainty in his eyes, which isn't typical for a weak fighter. The fight between mundane man and Anna Rosa start. Anna Rosa immediately closes the distance and starts attacking, but mundane parries or dodges her attacks. She sees a chance to defeat him and slashes him, but mundane appears behind her and tells her that was just an afterimage. Mundane then quickly overpowers her and Anna Rosa realizes that her only choice is to try and counterattack when he attacks. She waits for him to attack and attempts to counterattack, but Mundane dodges, which makes her realize he is still matching his attack to her and not the opposite. Mundane then slashes and defeats Anna Rosa. Perif states that Iris was right. Iris is surprised that someone as strong as Mundane was unnoticed for that long. Pair of states the next round would be Iris versus Mundane and wonders if she is confident that she can beat him. Iris states she can't match his beauty of swordplay, but it's not beauty that determines the winner. If this is all Mundane can do, then he won't be a match for her however, there is a good chance that he is hiding something, which is why he disguised his stance and technique throughout the tournament. After leaving, Pair of tells his man to investigate Mundane, noting it could be a problem if he is backed by the lawless city. His man wonders if he is part of Shadow Garden, but Perv dismisses it, because he is a man and also doubts that Shadow Garden have a reason to make a scene at the Bushin Festival. Elsewhere, Anna Rosa tells Mundane that she is completely defeated and explains that she left her country to become stronger and thanks him for the lesson. She wonders how he became that strong and Mundane states he abandoned everything in pursuit of strength. Sid had accomplished 70% of his plan at the Bushin Festival. 
He then wonders on how to finish it, and after defeating Iris to just disappears, stating his work is done. Or he wonders if he should get the evil route and act like an assassin from a shadowy organization. He returns home, but finds Claire waiting for him again and wondering if he had fun watching her match. Sid then guesses he is dead. Iris is practicing and recalls her path from being a young kid who won her fight battle to who is she now. She is determined to get results and prove that she has the power to stand up against the divine teachings. Iris sips milk coffee, she thinks mink coffee is yummy. Sid starts to like the VIP seating as the maids get him anything he wants free of charge. Iris sits next to him, guessing he is there to cheer for his sister, and explains that she is free today as she also has a duel. She notes that he is drinking coffee. In state she likes the smell, but doesn't like bitter flavors. Sid explains that if you put tons of milk and sugar, every kind of coffee will taste the same. Iris decides to try it and finds the milk coffee delicious. Moments later, Iris hears the guards stopping a woman with a sword and wants her to give it to them. Iris then sees it's Beatrix and explains she invited her. Realizing who Beatrix is, everyone gets excited and gathers around her. Beatrix uses the chance and asks them if they have seen her niece, but no one has seen her. They also ask her if some competitor caught her eye and Beatrix states it's Sid. People are surprised as Sid isn't really that good and his sister is much better, and some start to question if Beatrix is really that good. Paravashat drugs King Oriana again, but is annoyed by how the drug makes his odor sweet and tells his men to cover it with a perfume. Parag is sure that Rose will come to save her father and notes that since she showed signs of possession, she will also become prime material for the cult's experimentation. If Rose doesn't show up, Perv intends to use King Oriana to kill King Midgar. That will result in a war between the kingdoms and the destruction of Oriana Kingdom, and Perv will lose his status, but he doesn't really care. Perv plans to make the new king of Midgar his puppet and guesses the best time to move is during Iris' match, however, he is worried about mundane man as he couldn't find anything about him and worries that he could be quite dangerous. Perv is also worried about what Shadow Garden may do and that they may be working with Rose. He goes into the VIP seating and as he passes by Beatrix, she states that he and the king stink. Perv gets angry and orders the guards to take her, but Iris stops him and explains she is her guest and it is Beatrix the war goddess. Perv then realizes who she is and that she may have awakened the hero's blood. Beatrix apologizes and Perv does the same. He takes his seat and starts to worry about Beatrix guessing he needs to eliminate her as well. He also wonders if he will be able to assassinate the King of Midgar, but states it will all go normal if Rose shows up. Claire wins her fight and the Iris heads out for her match against Mundane Man. As their fight starts, Iris feels that she loses her head and jumps backwards in fear. She is surprised at what she did and gathers herself and stands up. At that moment, she feels she is losing her leg and realizes that the entire arena is in Mundane's striking range. Meanwhile, Rose gets close to the VIP seating but sees dead cult members. Beta and other Shadow Garden members appear behind her and tell her that she can proceed and fulfill her mission. Iris keeps feeling that she is losing limbs from Mundane's attacks. She realizes she feels that due to the look in his eyes and each time he slightly shifts his gravity center, which means it's done by his strength and not by an artifact. The crowd starts to get disappointed at Iris as she keeps backing up and feels that she is scared. Iris gets angry and attacks, but at that moment, she realizes that Mundane isn't even holding his sword. Everything he did was to make her see things and think he had his sword out. Mundane then pushes her sword away and grabs her by the throat and takes her down. Placing his sword at her neck, he wonders what is wrong as they are just starting. Perv can't believe that Iris lost without being even able to make a single move. Seeing Mundane, Beatrix states she wants to fight him. Rose then shows up and apologizes to her father, stating she made mistakes and will likely make one more, but she decided to follow the path she believed in. King Oriana then forgives all of her sins. Per is surprised as he didn't instruct him of saying that. Rose cries and jumps at Per, who then uses the king as a shield, however, Rose proceeds and stabs him. In his last moments, the king tells Rose that he loves her. Per is shocked at how easily she killed her father and gets angry. He then sees Rose holding her blade against her neck and orders his men to stop her. Mundane then comes from the window, asking if that's the choice Rose made, while cutting down Perv's men. Mundane then states it's time to reveal himself and turns to Shadow. 
Rose calls him stylish bandit slayer. Seeing him fight, she was reminded of her past when Sid had saved her from some bandits. Since that day when she saw his fencing, she decided to become a fencer herself. When Sid had killed all the bandits who kidnapped Rose, she asked him who he was. As Sid was still training back then, he is just a stylish bandit slayer. Rose is surprised to learn that Shadow was stylish bandit slayer, and even at that young age, he wasn't afraid and fought against evil. Shadow tells her that her fight isn't over. Rose then stands up and leaves. Perv wants to stop her, but all of his men are already defeated by other Shadow Garden members. Beatrix then states she will do it and jumps at Shadow. As they clash swords, Perv uses the chance to escape. After mundane man goes into the VIP seating and reveals his true appearance, Iris realizes that he is Shadow. King Midgar is informed that the battle between Shadow and Beatrix may go even outside of the stadium. The king asks about Perv and gets informed that he heading towards the outskirts on a carriage and is likely directly running back to Oriana Kingdom without stopping at the embassy. They are also taking good care of Oriana's king's body. King Midgar tells them that when they are returning it to the Oriana Kingdom, to go through Marquis Grant, who is the leader of the Anti-Chancellor faction and explains they need to prepare themselves as the darkness that has been lurking since ancient times has taken a deeper hue. Shadow is fighting Beatrix, however, he starts getting behind her with ease, while she barely manages to notice him in time and block his attacks. Iris shows up and states she wants to join the fight. She draws a blade and Shadow realizes it's a mithril blade with ancient runes, surprising him that she intends to use an artifact, but also amusing him that she would resort to what he sees as a clutch. Iris gets annoyed and turns the blade into a large fire sword and swings at Shadow. Shadow easily dodges and states that it has good visuals and is more fit for a festival spectacular. Beatrix then attacks him and Shadow continues her fight with her, with Iris joining Beatrix to fight Shadow. Their fight continues through the city and the two manage to push him towards a construction on a building. Shadow then takes two crowbars and blocks both Eris and Beatrix's attacks, noting that crowbars indeed have potential. As they keep on fighting, they end on top of a train where Shadow tells them to be careful to not fall. Meanwhile, Rose had escaped the stadium and wondered on what to do next. Alpha shows up and tells her that she has two choices to continue fighting alone or to fight alongside Shadow Garden. Rose asks Alpha if they intend to save Oriana's kingdom, but Alpha explains won't be doing anything to assist her as she is right now, and if she wishes to save her kingdom, she must show her worth. Thinking for a moment, Rose decides to join Shadow Garden. While they fight, Beatrix wonders if she and Shadow have met before. Shadow states he remembers powerful opponents, but wonders if they are strong enough for him to remember them. He jumps into the river and using magic he controls the water and shoots it at them, but notices that magic doesn't flow that good in ordinary water. He kicks Iris into the river, but as Beatrix attacks him, she manages to break his crowbar. As they keep fighting, they reach a tower where Shadow gets behind Beatrix, but she blocks it easily, noting that she got used to his attack. Shadow congratulates her, stating that in sword skill, they are almost equal, however, her use of magic isn't as good. Iris then comes attacking, but Shadow blocks her attack with his fist, stating that he can't be defeated with borrowed power. Iris tells Beatrix that she will immobilize him even if it costs her her life and then Beatrix can take him down. Iris attacks Shadow as she swings her sword, she lets it go and attempts to grab Shadow, however, Shadow kicks her in the chin with his knee. Beatrix finishes charging her attack and attacks at that moment, she knocks Shadow back, but he throws his up and dodges her attack and then grabs and slams her over Iris and then stomps both of them. Shadow attempts to leave, but the girls manage to stand up and Iris tells him that by now every knight in the city should have been mobilized. He has turned the whole kingdom into his enemy, and there isn't a place he can run to. However, to their shock, Shadow starts laughing maniacally and then states he ain't running as there is no reason to. Activating its destructive magic power, which covers the entire kingdom capital and states that the playtime is over. While this was happening, Princess Alexia Midgar continued training. Regardless of the situation in the capital, regardless of whether she dies or ends up reincarnating, she is determined to walk the path of the sword. Meanwhile, both Eris and Beatrix were stunned to see Shadow's power. Shadow starts casting his eye in atomic attack, but stops before the end and leaves. Seeing that, Iris drops to her knees and cries. Sherry read in the newspaper that the demon Shadow was chased away by Iris and Beatrix. Rose is still missing after she killed her father. In Oriana Kingdom, Mordred conveyed his disappointment with Perv, 
to the point where he was forced to beg his superiors forgiveness for his failure. Perov also told his superiors that as long as the cult holds the royal family, Rose won't be able to stay hidden. Plus, Oriana's situation is already very messy with the loss of their king. Perov is sure that Rose can't ignore it and will definitely come back. Mordred said hopefully so and told Perov not to disappoint him too much. Beatrix leaves the city, disappointed she couldn't find the one she was looking for. She tells Iris to not take her defeat too seriously as there are many things mortals can't defeat. Iris tells her not to worry because she's incapable of staying still. As Migger Kingdom is looking for Shadow, Beta guesses that was Shadow's plan to keep them occupied with himself and not get involved with the things happening in Oriana Kingdom. Since Shadow is actively involving himself, they decide to hurry up and tie up the loose ends and send more personnel to investigate the lawless city and keep a close eye on the major corporate alliance. With the new school term having started, Sid wonders where is Skell. Poe explains he took a long-term job. Poe regrets that he was outside the city when the demon Shadow appeared. Shadow covered the capital in magic, which must have frightened a lot of girls who would then have needed reassurance. Rose and Alpha reach the Kajian of Domain. Alpha then explains they are heading past the mountain and deeper into the woods. Rose is surprised as magical beasts infest the region. Alpha explains that when Shadow visited the mountains, he battled the Mist Dragon. The dragon lost and dubbed Shadow ruler of this realm and bathed him in dragon's breath. When they reach their destination in the forest, Alpha explains that this is the ancient city of Alexandria, Shadow Garden's base of operations. Alpha takes Rose to Lambda and explains that Rose is a new recruit and tells Lambda to train her. Lambda calls 664 and 665 and tells them that she is putting the new recruit in their squad, naming Rose as number 666. Lambda then cuts Rose's clothes telling her that she is now a nobody and is casting away her name, clothes, and everything to become a pure, unadulterated soldier. Rose watches in horror as the burger wrapper Sid gave her is ripped to shreds before wailing in utter despair. Back at the underground ruins, Shadow plays Moonlight Sonata, once more as feathers descend upon him. He says that everything has been going according to his designs, but the hour of awakening will be drawing near. After finishing his play, Shadow leaves while a soul black feather lands on the piano keyboards. In a mansion, the Shadow Garden group is discussing the latest updates about no suspicious activity by the cult of Diablos in the Midgar Kingdom since the incident at the Bushin Festival. This means they can now focus their attention on the situation in the Oriana Kingdom. Zeta and Ida share some troubling news about an increased flow of funds to the lawless city, which seems to surprise the MC, Sid Kagano, the leader of Shadow Garden. That region doesn't belong to any nation and is a giant slum and any tensions that occur there could have an insurmountable effect on the rest of the country. Sid says he can smell a bloodstorm coming as they all look out the window to look at the moon, which looks unusually red just like the legendary red moon from the tragedy of 1,000 years ago. Everyone is troubled and starts to murmur, but Alpha takes the lead. No doubt she's named Alpha and starts to say the Seven Shadows will handle the situation, but Sid interrupts her saying he'll take care of the money. His subordinates seem worried that he's going to go all alone, but he assures them to relax and that the moon is just as beautiful when red. Thus, they feel grateful they're able to observe its beauty because of him. Sid seems to think involving these girls makes even the red moon come to life. Seriously, their ad-libbing skills are worthy of an Academy Award. Two men arrive at the Crimson Tower ruled by the Blood Queen, one of the three rulers of the Lawless City. It's essentially just a castle of vampires, but not even the corpse raiding vultures dare to go near it afraid they'll turn into hideous ghouls. The second man teases the first for being afraid saying it's just a lousy hangout for shut-ins. A creepy looking vampire on the roof says such lousy vermin can't be here since only the Blood Queen and her servants or powerful guests are allowed to enter. However, they laugh right at his face saying they're here to hunt the queen herself and the vampire finds this extremely amusing. He likes it when he finds people more foolish than him. He shows them what happens to those who dare to against her as he's such an example himself. He lost his right arm and is kept here much like a pathetic watchdog on a leash. The vampire's power level is quite high and he says he used to be just like them once, called the White Devil. They recognize him as the wanted criminal with a large bounty on his head as he leaps toward them to attack. Sid arrives at the lawless city. It's even more of a dump than he imagined. He's led by his sister, Claire, who takes him to the Dark Knight Association for a meeting. It's an unofficial organization that exists for Dark Knights who don't belong to any public institutions. 
Sid remembers how in the summer of his last year of high school, his journey came to an abrupt end. Or so it seemed, since he was reincarnated and one thing led to another, and he's here now. His sister had won the Bushin Festival Championship so to celebrate he used his connections with Gamma to get dressed up and go for a free high-end dinner at Mitsugoshi Restaurant. That's where Claire announced she was going to the lawless city to exterminate vampires. That's how he ended up being dragged through the city by her. She promises to pry open a spot for him at the Knight's Order after his graduation. He understands she's just trying to bulk up his resume. This sets him thinking because he's never considered his future before. Claire will inherit the estate out in the boondocks, and he'll just end up doing some random job. He already has his own job, so he doesn't care about anything else that he'll have to do. Claire inquires about what it is that he wants to do, but he doesn't tell. Seeing Claire drag Sid through the streets, a vendor calls out to show her his latest collection of pets. The Dark Knight Little Goldie who's all beaten up. He quotes 27 billion and offers to add cue ball Quentin. Another fresh catch. Two pets for 37 million because they're all bruised and battered Sid seems to recognize them both. However, Claire ends up rejecting his offer saying she has everything she needs and they start arguing about how Sid will get lost if she lets him go. Turns out he does get lost when he leaves the inn for just a minute because he is bored. People end up giving him charity because he looks homeless and he thinks he's living the dream life just strolling and collecting money. Suddenly, he comes across some people beating a ghoul that's a vampire underling in an alley. It's night and as soon as the red moon shines and with a surge of energy, the presumed dead ghoul gets up and attacks them. Sid knows a human bitten by a ghoul will also turn into one themselves. Now he sees it with his own eyes as the red moon is stimulating magical energy all over the town and now two ghouls approach him. He knows he has to stop them before they spread at an incredibly fast rate. He's debating whether to put on a mysterious stranger act when suddenly a girl with red hair sees what's happening, assumes he's in danger, and kills the ghouls. She introduces herself as Mary, the ancient vampire hunter. She tells him to run if he values his life before she disappears, leaving him with a feeling of thrill and excitement. Claire returns to the inn and it's safe to say she's furious when she doesn't find Sid there. She saves a random man at the inn from a ghoul and goes to look for him. Meanwhile, Poe and Skell are glad they were able to escape the academy and think no one will be able to find them here to expel them. The summer may be over, but their virginity is still going strong. However, they end up being attacked by ghouls who seem to be spreading faster and faster. A young girl who's clearly been taken advantage of by an old man turned ghoul is saved by Sid, who just repeats all the dialogues Mary said to him. Is he really obsessed because she's so cool? Another woman walks in and asks the girl, Marie, if she's okay, but she says the shadow saved her. That woman seems to know the shadow as the evil mastermind who had a field day beating up the corrupt clergy and says he's as dangerous as any of the rulers of this city. Marie refuses to believe he's a bad man, decides to break her contract, and prepares to leave the city. Lady Yukim is informed that the vampires have set ghouls loose in the city. Poor Claire hugs a random corpse and cries thinking it's her dead brother when Mary approaches her and tells her that's not Sid. She tells him she met two men recently that match her description, one who was smiling in front of a ghoul just as the moon turned red, and Claire immediately dismisses that couldn't possibly be Sid. Mary saw the second one not long ago, a dark knight with no noticeable features captured and about to be taken away by the Blood Queen's followers. Claire thinks her brother is in the Crimson Tower, and Mary informs her that they plan to offer him to the Queen as a sacrifice. To awaken Blood Queen Elizabeth from her 1,000-year slumber, they require the blood of a living young man. She's surprised that the Queen's slumber has been kept secret for so long just so she would awaken on a night like this with the Red Moon. Claire and Mary team up to find Sid because they're headed in the same direction. Ho and Skell try their best to escape the ghouls. They don't want to die without having any physical contact with a girl except their moms. The Dark Knights fighting the ghouls are saved by the Shadow once more repeating the lines he heard from Mary. Lord Crimson's plan to take over the city is almost complete with the ghoul invasion, but he's informed they're facing some unexpected resistance. He thinks it's the fools who think they're his equals. Yukima, the Spirit Fox, ruler of the White Tower, and Juggernaut the Tyrant, ruler of the Black Tower. He's certain they'll meet their end once the Blood Queen revives. But there is someone else too who's going around the city killing ghouls. Sid is determined to stay on his quest to become the eminence in shadow as she shows up in front of Yukima and Juggernaut. A warrior kills everyone in his way while powering through to the royal capital castle. No one is able to stop him. 
The power he feels while killing humans is everything to him, as he says. We see a lot of dead bodies cut in half on the ground, and it seems like a clear accomplishment for him until a person with red hair comes out and slices off his right arm in a swift attack. This came out of nowhere, and it was seemingly his victory until this happened. Should have been a little quiet with all the killings, I think. No look what happened to him. He is kept a prisoner at the royal castle. But the thirst of killing humans is getting him from the inside. He just wants to slice up some humans. He seems to be getting out of control until one day, some more warriors arrive. The ghouls have taken over a lot of towns, and it seems to be getting a lot worse with time. The tyrant comes out killing some of the ghouls. He seems very strong, and is actually the captain of the Black Tower. A chained up warrior is looking at him with envy as he kills everyone in his way. Then come out the warrior of the White Tower Spirit the Fox. She is even stronger than him, some would say, and she starts to attack the Tarrant. The fight is getting a lot tense when all of a sudden a warrior comes out of nowhere bringing a haul to their fight. This is the shadow who kills everyone who lurks in the shadows. You could have come up with something a lot cooler. He seems to believe that everything is coming to an end because the red moon is up. Tyrant mocks his thinking or even somewhat praises it as he strikes through the ancient artifact of a gate of the castle. The chained up warrior cannot believe his eyes seeing Tarrant break this door with just his sword. The fox seems to have some kind of friendly relationship with the shadow and excuses herself. Shadow is walking out of the scene when the chained up warrior looks at him. He feels little to no energy from him. Thinking he is weaker than him, he jumps out with his sword getting his wish to slice up someone, but gets slit through himself. His body is cut in half by the shadow, and he has no idea what just happened. Shadow walks away saying the red moon has appeared and it will bring horrors with it. We see Alpha in the Royal Library looking for an answer to her theory. She is researching about the vampires and the possessed and searching for a clue if their hypothesis is right or not. She is here with Bettis to look for the sample to take to the Lord Shadow. Alpha is going through every book when suddenly she hears a thudding noise from one side of the library. It is Claire and Mary coming to Claire's brother. Alpha comes out to talk to themselves about their job here, which makes them a little suspicious. Apparently Alpha knows about these two. However, she means no harm as she is only here to collect samples for her theory. She explains how she has come to the conclusion that the vampires and the possessed are the same when going back to the roots. She seems quite sure that this is true somehow. Claire has a personal question for her. She wants to know if the possessed can be cured some way. But she doesn't get a straight answer. Claire wants to hurry as they do not want to wait any longer because if they do, the Blood Queen will sacrifice her brother. Hearing about her brother, one of the Bettas gets shocked and starts freaking out. Alpha calms her down calling her 666. Her name is 666. Illuminati confirmed. Mary and Claire leave to finish their work, and while leaving, Alpha says something about experiencing Haven again that kind of pisses off Mary. Claire notices this and asks her about if after they handle a vampire. After killing the vampire, Claire wonders why Mary is acting all weird after what Alpha said. Clearly, Mary doesn't want to talk about it, but is constantly thinking about it. She wonders how the Alpha knew about Haven. Claire seems to think that Mary, the vampire slayer, was almost taking the vampire's side for a second there but she stops her from asking more, telling her to not pry in her secrets. They are walking upstairs getting closer to Sid, the brother, when they see the Tarrant fighting the top vampires of the royal castle. He is slicing and killing them like they are toys. They are so easy to kill. The Tarrant is very cool in my opinion. As he is killing every last vampire, Mary and Claire are watching him from behind a pillar. Mary feels it is for the best to not engage in a fight with him because he is too strong. They decide to leave without making any noise when Tarrant comes at them in a split second. He can sense them easily and punches Claire out of the scene. Mary comes to help but gets sliced through herself in one strike. Claire gets up to help and offers to heal Mary when Mary asks to suck her blood to heal. I have never seen any kind of vampire suck blood through the victim's mouth. She just wanted an excuse to kiss. After sucking her blood, Mary gets super cyan level of strength and attacks Tyrant. Getting a real fight after so long, Tarrant is very excited to get more of her. He is still very strong even after Mary gets a boost of power. In a blink of an eye, Tarrant teleports right behind Claire ready to attack her when Shadow comes out of nowhere, throwing Tyrion out of the castle with a single kick. Claire and Mary have no idea what just happened and who this guy is. Hearing his name, Mary recognizes him. Shadow leaves saying the frenzy has begun and they have very little time remaining. Claire is still shocked to see Mary just suck her blood. 
Mary apologizes and promises to tell everything about herself. She starts by telling her that she is herself a vampire. Vampires used to kill and devour humans like animals, and within them was the Blood Queen. But a time came when humans discovered vampires' weaknesses and the hunter became the hunted. Vampires were falling like flies and within no time, there were so few left of them. Blood Queen was also one of the survivors living among humans. She wanted to live with peace and harmony among them, so she gave up drinking blood and so did everyone following her. This came with benefits and disadvantages, because not drinking blood made the vampires very weak, but the plus side of this was that they could live under the sunlight. The thirst for the blood was still there, but everyone managed to live without it, except the queen. The queen had so much need of the blood that her body still burned in the sunlight. The haven Alpha was talking about was almost complete. Because of the queen, everyone was living so happily, but the night came. The red moon appeared, and three kingdoms fell under its weight. Shadow is having fun killing all of the vampires around, but is not getting what he wants. He wanted to find the boss to have a splendid battle with him, but it turns out that is not going to happen anytime soon. He feels like this is one of those events where they focus more on group fighting than the bosses. So maybe they don't even have an actual boss. Every event has a boss, just wait and watch. Disappointed by everything, Shadow decides to finish up the rest of the vampires and see if he finds any boss. If he doesn't, he is going to go home taking the rest of the gold coins. As he leaves, we see some kind of an evil flower bloom. The girls reach the scene looking for MC and Queen Elizabeth. Claire looks for her brother while Mary wants to see if Elizabeth is revived or not. They get a little separated from one another when Mary yells at Claire to watch out. Claire turns to look but gets stabbed through her heart with a giant tentacle type of arm. It is the flower and it has bloomed into a giant rose flower. We see Queen Elizabeth inside the flower and she is revived. Mary doesn't know how to feel about this situation as Elizabeth takes Claire and brings her close to herself. Bringing her clothes, Elizabeth is ready to suck her blood out. Mary tries to stop her but she is too far away to reach her and stop in time. She is sucking Claire's blood when suddenly, Alpha with others shows up, saving Claire from Elizabeth. They attack Elizabeth and blast her into pieces. Thinking that Elizabeth is done for, they look at Claire to see if they can save her. They see that the injuries she has endured are too fatal and first aid is not going to be enough for her. They are figuring out a way to help Claire when Elizabeth brings herself back to normal. She looks like is sleeping while causing this chaos. Alpha knows that they have to fight her with her with their full strength. They have to make sure the Lord's sister is safe as their Lord is nowhere to be seen. Alpha gets ready to take Elizabeth on, telling 664 to join her while others give her cover. She attacks Elizabeth but barely gets a blow on her. Elizabeth is getting stronger by the minute and they cannot keep handling her for much longer. As they are fighting, Yukim is watching from up above. Suddenly, they think they have managed to cause some damage when Elizabeth bursts out with a huge magical energy. Her power can be felt for miles and this intrigues Yukima. She knows she has to be careful around her now. Mary knows her queen and how she is the most powerful even though she admits Alpha and others are powerful as well. Everyone is focused on Queen Elizabeth when the juggernaut of the Black Power jumps in landing a punch on Elizabeth. This guy is fun to watch for some reason. The punch didn't do anything, in fact, it hurt the guy himself. Queen powers up and rains slicing attacks from above on everyone present. It goes on for a hot minute before stopping and it causes a lot of damage to everyone. Juggernaut is fully wounded and bleeding from several spots, while Yukim is fine somehow. Mary is fine as well but looks to see Alpha injured yet standing. She is bleeding from several places as well while others are trying to save Claire from these attacks. Alpha asks 666 to take Claire and get out of there. She doesn't want to go but Alpha insists that she get out as she has a lot of things yet to do for her. Alpha is about to attack Elizabeth when suddenly, Elizabeth makes her hands pop open with just a glance. The glance attacks are always very cool. I'm looking at you Jiren. Her blood is rotting and spewing outside of her hand. This is not normal as she is possessed. Alpha turns to look and to her horror, her other members are also enduring the same injury. Everyone's blood is clotting outside of their body. She cannot figure out how she is doing this, but she knows that somehow, Queen Elizabeth is controlling the demon blood. Suddenly, Claire also starts getting the same treatment and hers is way worse. She is about to die because of the blood rotting when we see her waking up inside a hospital. She is all fine on a bed and wakes up to see Aurora sitting right in front of her on her laptop. She wants to know what happened and how she got here all of a sudden when Aurora tells her something very shocking. 
she explains that her possession has been cured and it is he who did it. This he is someone new and Claire has no idea who she is talking about. She asks Aurora about this person but she isn't giving her a straight answer. Aurora tells her instead that she has not a lot of time before her body turns into a rotten mess and there is nothing she can do to stop that. She goes on a rant telling her about evolution and how monkeys adapted to the environment to turn into humans. She wants her to know that she has both types of blood, the possessed kind and the vampire kind. Both of them are trying to adapt inside her body together, and it is not going well. Claire wants to know if there is something she can do to stop it, but Aurora reminds her that there is not. Suddenly, something happens and some kind of lining on the arm of Claire starts shining. Aurora gets up ready to leave saying that time is up and she has to go now. Claire keeps asking her to at least tell her who is he, but she avoids answering the question when right at the door, she tells her that key is shadow. This shocks Claire, and we are back at the fighting grounds again. Claire has awakened somehow, shocking everyone. Beta and Mary have no idea what just happened and why Claire looks different all of a sudden. This is not Claire but Aurora and her body somehow. She is here to take on Queen Elizabeth. Aurora looks pretty confident in herself and tells Beta that she is here to take care of everyone and handle this Queen of Mary. Seeing Aurora, Queen is alert and blasts her but Aurora easily handles the attack. Controlling the stealing blood is not okay and she uses Elizabeth's attack right at her, slicing her into pieces once again. Everyone is shocked to see her handle the Queen like that. Aurora wants to take this chance to quickly finish off Queen and prepare for the ending blow. Saying that she wants to hear the divine power, Aurora prepares the attack and strikes the queen with her. But that doesn't happen and her hand and neck are blasted. She feels like this body of Claire cannot control that power right now and she just made a simple mistake. Seeing her slit neck, Beta is worried to death, but Aurora assures her that everything is fine. She heals herself back to normal in a second. Beta is surprised to see her do this easily. Queen takes the chance and attacks Aurora again, and this time she is having a difficult time stopping her. Beta is worried about her but she explains that she was here just to buy time for him to show up and he is here. Suddenly with a huge blast, Shadow makes an entry and shocks everyone. Juggernaut knows who this is yet everyone else doesn't. They are surprised to feel such immense power from a single person. Seeing Shadow, Queen wastes no time and blasts him but Shadow handles her attack like a child play. Everyone is impressed seeing Shadow stand up to the Queen like that. Beta is happy to see Shadow but wonders why he is here. She feels like he cannot be here just to fight the queen, but Shadow says that he cannot afford to lose any single one of them. Beta is rooting for Shadow and lets him know that she believes in him. She yells at the top of her lungs saying that she knows that he is going to win. Shadow feels like this is his chance and he cannot afford to lose for the second time. Saying this, he jumps at Queen Elizabeth. Creating his sword, Elizabeth does the same and creates her sword from her powers to fight. They are ready to battle head on and the fight begins. They are flying through the sky, landing blows on each other while everyone watches. The animation is great I have to say, one of the best. Aurora looks at them fighting and feels happy that Shadow is the one that is going to win for sure. Juggernaut on the other hand is frustrated seeing that they are having fun alone. He wants to fight as well but cannot compete with these two so he has to stay put. After a while of fighting, Shadow and Queen come close to each other when Shadow tells her that she is going to be finished here. Impressed by the confidence, Elizabeth asks his name. He is about to tell his name when Mary notices something and yells the Queen's name. He says that his name is Recovery Atomic and right then, everything changes and the environment turns back to the way it was. The Red Moon is gone and everything is recovered somehow. We see people grateful that they are alive. Some people are complaining that they lost their armor and different things while others are happy to be just alive after all that mess. We see the city back to the way it was before. We see MC standing by the train while Claire says goodbye to Mary. Claire is worried about her as she now knows that she has special powers in her left hand. On the train, Claire and MC are heading somewhere when Care shares with MC that she has a special condition somehow and has special powers trapped in her left hand. She is worried that this might affect her brother but MC is hopeful and confident in her that she will be able to pull through this. He knows that his sister has many trials and tribulations in her life ahead, but he will be right by her side always to support her. This makes Care very happy. Alpha, Beta, and others also left while Juggernaut of the Black Power was sitting drinking. He is impressed by Shadow and wants to fight him someday, 
Back on the train, Claire is curious and asks MC if he knows about Shadow. MC knows about him as the person who burnt their school but doesn't know why she is asking about it. Claire drops the subject as it is too complicated to get into right now. A high-value Mitsugoshi cargo carriage, laden with precious goods, is ambushed by a formidable gang of bandits. These criminals have forcibly extracted the female Mitsugoshi employees from the carriages and are in the process of pillaging the cargo, which includes valuable commodities such as tea leaves, cocoa, coffee, and other products estimated to be worth a staggering 100 million zini. As the bandits go about their criminal endeavors, one of them confides in the terrified women about their sinister motives. He asserts that the Mitsugoshi company's exceptional profitability and rapid expansion pose a great concern for his boss. The anxious young woman cautiously inquires about the identity of this employer. The bandit reveals the name Garter, the president of the major corporate alliance, MCA, and a figure of high standing in society. The young woman voices her skepticism, noting that Garter is well known for his devout adherence to the divine teachings and his significant contributions to the church. It seems inconceivable that such a man would employ bandits to disrupt honest business activities. In response, the bandit cautioned her about the hidden facets of every individual's character. In a calm, the woman asserts that there is no point in reiterating what they already know. In a remarkable turn of events, they suddenly find themselves encircled by an assembly of women dressed entirely in black. It's the Shadow Garden. With the removal of their disguises, the women reveal their true identities as fellow Shadow Garden members, with no trace of dread left on their faces anymore. The bandits, taken aback and overmatched, have no chance as they succumb to a merciless one-sided onslaught. Following this swift and decisive encounter, one of the Shadow Garden women named New reports to Alpha that their assault has considerably diminished the strength of the MCA. Scale and Poe proudly parade their recently acquired designer outfits from Kamatsa du Mitsugoshi to Sid during their lunch, proclaiming it to be their latest ploy to charm the ladies. Sid notes that anything design-related from Mitsugoshi is probably from Ida, which increases the number of girls who may bank off Shadow's knowledge. As Skell continues to flaunt his new attire, the Kamatsa du Mitsugoshi logo unexpectedly peels off from his shirt, revealing the emblem of the store where they had made their purchase. Skell is disheartened by the realization that he's sporting a knockoff, but he attempts to console himself by suggesting that they can simply reattach the logo as if it were a minor issue. Sid, meanwhile, has a revelation regarding the clothing he's wearing, which was prepared by Alpha and her team. He realizes that the attire he's seen people wearing, which he had assumed to be commonplace in the new world, is, in fact, a product of Mitsugoshi. He understands that this revelation is the result of the knowledge he shared with the girls to expand their market share. With a disapproving expression, he remarks on the unfairness of taking business from others, causing discontent among those who've been affected. He departs declaring his intention to reclaim everything that rightfully belongs to him, leaving Poe and Skell confused by his cryptic statement. In his dorm room, Sid outfits himself in a sleek black suit, securing his hair in a tidy short ponytail. He completes his transformation with a magician's mask, unveiling his latest persona, the super elite secret agent known as John Smith. Fully prepared, he proceeds to rendezvous with Yukim in an unoccupied train compartment. Upon meeting, Yukim expresses her satisfaction at having Shadow on their side, but Sid promptly disowns the name, declaring his intention to go by John Smith henceforth. He asserts that his collaboration with Yukim is primarily motivated by the prospect of a profitable partnership. During their meeting, Yukim provides John with an update on recent developments in the market. She reveals that Garter has convened a meeting of the major corporate alliance to discuss fortifying their strategies against Mitsugoshi. Emphasizing the ongoing conflict between Mitsugoshi and the MCA, she underscores their intent to seize everything. Yukim implores John to take action on their behalf cautioning him about the formidable Getan, the sword devil who has assumed control over the NCA. She underscores his ruthlessness, noting that he stops at nothing to achieve his objectives. To demonstrate her commitment, Yukim discreetly reveals a deep scar on her back while mentioning her plans to handle Getan herself. As the train comes to a halt, John takes his leave, vowing to obliterate the existing order and rebuild it from the ground up. The following day, NCA-affiliated merchants in the capital held a massive sale on all their products. Scale Poe and Sid eagerly attended to take advantage of the bargains. During their shopping, Sid couldn't help but notice that Mitsugoshi had pushed the envelope too far, making enemies of local traders and jeopardizing their own future. 
He remarked that their competitors would likely bring Mitsugoshi down, and when that happened, he would use the capital he had acquired to establish a new corporation, offering managerial positions to Alpha and girls. As they proceeded to pay for their purchases, Sid noticed that the banknote Poe handed over was different from the usual currency. Poe explained that it was the new MCA-issued banknote, and the sales event was designed to celebrate its release. Intrigued, Sid requested a closer look. Upon inspection, he discerned significant disparities between Mitsugoshi's banknote and the MCA's. The Mitsugoshi banknote uses multicolor printing and has a carefully placed watermark, while the MCA's version had simpler, cruder printing and a less detailed design. Sid recollected sharing details with the girls about an MHK documentary on banks and credit creation which seemed to have inspired them to establish their own bank. In a sudden recollection, Sid shared a childhood memory with the two friends. He recounted how, as a child, he had aspired to make copies of a 1,000 yen bill using a copy machine at a local store. However, he abandoned this dream after a cashier scolded him. Skell and Poe were puzzled by the story, and Poe asked Sid to return his money. Sid, refusing the request, swiftly takes off with it. In his John Smith persona, Sid met up with Yukim once again to share his findings. He explained that the banknotes were essentially worth nothing more than paper, as long as the banks held the gold reserves. Their sole advantage was the convenience they offered over carrying gold coins. He handed Yukim the two banknotes and asked her to spot the differences between them. As she examined the notes, she soon realized that it would be easier to create counterfeit versions of the NCA banknotes. John proposed that they capitalize on this opportunity and profit from it. However, Yukim promptly shot down the idea, explaining that since these banknotes were only in circulation within the capital, it would be relatively simple to trace the source of any fake ones. John, disheartened, approached Yukim with a more menacing tone, pressing her to confirm if this was what she thought. Yukim pondered the situation for a brief moment, and then she put forward a plan. She suggested that they intentionally let the fake notes be discovered. Once rumors of counterfeit bills circulating in the public domain spread, it would create a credit crisis, leading to the devaluation of the banknotes. However, if they cashed out their holdings before the crisis took hold, they would be safe. Yukim nervously smiled as she presented this strategy to John. Once again, John posed the question menacingly, inquiring if this was indeed what she thought. Yukim, sweat running down her face, confirmed her stance, saying yes. With Yukima's affirmation, John disembarked from the train with a gloomy expression. Afterward, Sid headed out for his evening meal and encountered Delta. During their interaction, Delta picked up on the distinct scent of a fox that clung to Sid. Curious, she inquired about it, and Sid explained that he had been engaged in hunting foxes, causing the scent. With that, Delta swiftly proposed that Sid join her in hunting bandits. However, Sid politely declined her offer, advising her to attend to the tasks Alpha had assigned her first. Delta gazed at Sid with big pleading eyes, which he noted reminded him of his pet dog John from his previous life. Ultimately, he conceded, promising to join her in the hunt once she had fulfilled her duties to Alpha. Garter provides Getten with a comprehensive briefing on the MCA's most recent activities within the lavish confines of Getten's adorned office. He conveys the surprising discovery that Mitsugashi's private soldiers possess more formidable strength than they had initially estimated. In response to this development, Getten suggests deploying the Clovers, an elite assassination squad handpicked by him, to address the situation. Shadow and Delta rendezvous later for their bandit hunting mission. Delta takes a merciless approach, swiftly dispatching the bandits, while Shadow searches through their treasure. He can't help but grumble about how Delta leaves no bandits for him to deal with. However, the situation takes an unexpected turn when a muscular man intervenes, urging Delta to cease her actions. To Shadow's astonishment, she complies. The man identifies himself as Zebra, claiming to be Delta's brother, a fact that Delta confirms by detecting their father's scent on him. Zabra goes on to explain that he now serves under the great wolf, Getten. But before he can say more, Delta abruptly stabs him in the chest, leaving him lifeless. Shocked, Shadow questions whether it's acceptable to have killed her own brother. Delta callously responds, stating that weaklings only bring disgrace to the family. She proceeds to share that their father, the clan's chief, has over a thousand offspring, making the loss of one inconsequential. Shadow, in an attempt to change the topic, suggests that he should visit the Therianthrope lands sometime. Delta becomes enthusiastic and tells Shadow that if he can defeat her father, he could become the clan's chief. She promises him a hundred women and a hundred offspring, but Sid declines her offer. Garter provides a report to Getten, 
informing him that the fourth leaf, Zebra, has been defeated. He further notes that in recent months, their firepower has been significantly diminished, leaving them with almost nothing. Garter, in his pragmatic approach, advises a temporary retreat to reevaluate their situation. However, Getten dismisses this suggestion and asserts that Garter should simply adhere to his orders. Getten proposes an alternative strategy, emphasizing that they should intensify their offensive against Mitsugoshi and aim to acquire all of their closely guarded trade secrets. Getten dismisses Garter, then proceeds to stare out the window with his scared eyes hidden behind his glasses. At Mitsugoshi's headquarters, Gamp reports to Alpha about the company's condition. Thus far, the targeted attacks against transport vehicles have been repealed, and Mitsugoshi remains economically dominant. The major corporate alliance initiatives are ambitious, but they lack the wherewithal to implement them. Gamma confidently predicts that without shadow wisdom, they will be destroyed by themselves. Alpha quietly reminds Gamma that under no circumstances should the connection between Shadow Garden and the Mitsugoshi company be revealed to the public. Gamma concurs but warns passive measures are the only way to adhere to this restraint. Nu interrupts the women's conversation to announce the arrival of guests. Patience does not seem to be a quality that defines the visitor's leader. Alpha instructs Nu to welcome the guests with proper decorum. Gamma interposes mid-sentence and asks for the privilege to act as host. The following silence is broken by Alpha repeating her earlier order to Nu. Confirming everyone's fears, Gamma reiterates her earlier request. Alpha finally agrees, and Omega and Chi grudgingly accompany her. The uninvited guests had entered Mitsugoshi commenting on the lack of security. Their mission to locate Manager Luna is completed when the target confronts them on her own accord. Omega and Chai rush two of the three intruders, leaving one combatant, Leaf One, to face Gamma. His confidence does not waver, and he judges Gamma's equanimity as a bluff. That notion quickly vanishes when a swift chop to Gamma's head only makes her complain about the dull pain. She criticizes his first attack, claiming a powerful frontal assault followed by close observation is the best approach. Gamma materializes her slime sword and begins an onslaught of continuous thrusts. While fast, the technique is immaturous. Gamma infuses her sword with magic and asks if Leaf One is a practitioner of the school of Western Leech and Roy fencing. Leaf One is incredulous that she identified his techniques after a few seconds. Magically infused thrusts continue to assail him, Recognizing that Gamma could perceivably predict his next move, he aims another strike on Gamma's head. Using a blade rather than an open hand makes no difference, the results were the same. Gamma recognizes her opponent's strength and gives him the honor of facing her full might. She begins the secret strategy that her master taught her. The art of jam a lot of magical energy into it and hack away. Collateral damages keep on piling up as Gamma haphazardly swings her sword. The onslaught comes to an abrupt end as the wild combatant stumbles over the protruding slats of the walk. The subsequent unnamed magic blows a hole in the wall of Mitsugoshi. After recovering from her faceplant, Gamma once again acknowledges Leaf One as a master combatant who led her into a trap. Chai and Omega arrive to assist Gamma with her bloody nose, having finished their fights. Leaf One realizes that his companions have been defeated and attempts a tactile retreat through the newly formed hole. Gamma pursues the fleeing man, only to trip again. The sword retains motion and flies out of her hands. The whirling blade miraculously pierces Leaf One's neck. An explosion, a moribund man, and an exasperated Alpha are the results of the blast. Gamma proudly chuckles and proclaims it as a secret technique. The self-sacrifice spinning wheel. The unsuccessful raid forces guarded to admit the failure to the lycanthrope warrior Getten. They have lost contact with all Clover members, deployed reinforcements, and the surveillance team. Garter articulates that some major corporate alliance members have financial ties with Mitsugoshi and will not remain silent. Getten dismisses the issue and orders the president to squelch any dissenters. Garter can only swallow his protests as he leaves the wolf like intro. Getten reflects that giving the Clover's titles may have overinflated their perceived worth. The cult of Diablo's children would have been a better option but after the deaths of Greece and Lutheran, the allocation of resources has been spread thin. The setbacks do not dissuade Getten. He views it as a valid way to demonstrate his strength and value to the cult. After their acceptance, he will have power that no one can challenge. Under the setting sun, two people are engaged in sparring. Alexia is fiercely engaging the uninterested Sid. After several engagements, Alexia manages to disarm her black-haired opponent. A slow clap follows this accomplishment, drawing a sigh from the winner. 
the two break for food, selecting a bun food stand for dinner. Alexia asks for Sid's opinion on her progress. He confirms that she is getting stronger. Sid quietly wonders what triggered the change. He concludes it was either a change in mindset or the discovery of a solution to a previous problem. Alexia continues to eat her bun and expresses dissatisfaction about her advancement. She believes that her current power is not enough. An unenthusiastic reply forces Alexia to guide Sid on a proper reaction. After Sid is coerced into asking why, Alexia confesses that she no longer wants to feel like a spectator. Her one friend is suffering. The world is moving without her, and if she stays ideal, she will be abandoned. Parting from Sid, Alexia expresses how carefree Sid is about life. She wishes Sid could remain that way for as long as he lives. Later that night, John Smith quietly drinks sake at a noodle shop. A cat-like canthrope approaches the counter and asks for an extra-large order of char siu. Without turning her gaze, Yukim's attendant reports that production has been completed. The debonair gentleman's face finally changes, warping into a smile. He sneers that the time has arrived. Yukim subsequently explains to John Smith how the operation is organized. The production center is located in an inconspicuous viscountcy. Law enforcement is not the highest priority as a desultory magistrate oversees the fiefdom's governance. Printing presses will be housed in an abandoned coal mine, and all produced items will be transferred to a lawless city distribution center. Counterfeit banknotes will be circulated into Migur Kingdom from lawless city to avoid backtracking. Yukim's second attendant presents John Smith with a genuine and imitation banknote. The spirit fox asks the suave gentleman if he can tell the difference between the two. Rapidly darting his eyes back and forth, John Smith deridingly declares it is obvious. He flicks the bills back to Yukima and pontificates the discrepancies. One of them uses coarser paper, consequently, the ink bleeds differently, and there are distortions in the print. Yukima exclaims in shock about his deductions while John Smith secretly fist bumps. She avers that the higher quality bill is fake. John Smith started to say the same thing verbatim, but the end sounded off. In an attempt to replicate it perfectly, Yukim surpassed the original design. John Smith assures the worried Yukim that few people could tell the difference. She announces distribution will begin immediately and reminds John Smith of his two promises, to thwart any pursuers and to leave Getten for her. He took everything from her. It is only suitable to reciprocate and take his life as reparation. The masked man sighs and agrees to the terms. He reminds Yukima to mind her steps, Revenge can lead people astray if the path gets muddied. Shadow Garden caught onto the counterfeits after a few bills appeared in their Mitsugoshi stores. Gamma explains to Alpha that the patrons seemed unaware that the currency was forged. Alpha asks about the major corporate alliance's awareness of the issue. Gamma states they are oblivious to the threat and keep issuing new cash. As it may lead to a predicament, Alpha orders Gamma to bring their attention to it. Mistrust about one currency would lead to doubt about the other, leading to a credit crisis. Mitsugoshi's adoption of fractional reserve banking would make a bank run catastrophic. Alpha considers this scenario may be their intention but dismisses conjecture for another time. Their priority is to find the distribution site. Thanks to Shadow Garden, NCA discovers the spreading of fake money. Garter quickly reports this development to Getten. The blind warrior asks which note is inauthentic, but Garter is not confident in his answer. Getten orders the corpulence merchant to track down the origin. Garter quickly accepts, dashing out of the room. Now alone, Getten admits the circulation of NCA currency exceeds their total liquid capital. He assumes it is the same for Mitsugoshi. The plan Alpha was worried about is revealed to be Getten's true purpose, but it was not supposed to go into effect this early. The cult of Diablo's capital is wrapped up in NCA assets, and Getten has not finished separating them. If the premature circulation continues, the cult could lose a sizable fortune. As darkness falls on Lawless City, 664, 665, and 666 descend on an outward bound train. It is confirmed to be carrying contraband, including counterfeit NCA banknotes. Other teams will search for the counterfeiters, but 664 Squad is in charge of intercepting the cargo. The leader singles out 666 for making questionable decisions. All she has to remember is to follow orders. 666 says she understands, but 664 expresses doubt. 665 sneakily eats something and tells the two to get along. After jumping down from the roof, the three women cell begins its infiltration. The absence of passengers is understandable, but no guards is abnormal. 
666 notices something glistening and warns her teammates to be cautious. Before any response could be expected, a web of wires binds 664 and 665. A sonorous voice asking the women for their tickets makes 666 turn her head. Instead of a conductor or ticket collector, there is a dapper gentleman controlling the wires with the tips of his fingers. 664 pulls out a knife to cut the constricting threads, but the blade snaps before making a mark. 666 realizes it is reinforced with magic and demands his name. John Smith obliges and manipulates his obscure weapon of choice to ensnare the remaining number. 666 valiantly charges forward, but her sword catches on a few strands at the last second. John Smith acknowledges that her decision was correct, but chastises her for being too inexperienced to do it properly. Untroubled by her proximity, he tightens the bound around 666. John Smith announces that he knows they would come, but their appearance is too soon. They cannot be allowed to know any more, and with a swift motion of his hands, John Smith defenestrates the bound trio. Recovering on the ground outside, 666 prepares for a counterattack, but 664 orders her to stand down. Engaging the target without a plan would lead to the same result. As if to signal their withdrawal, the train accelerates away from the defeated women. The only option is to report to Gamma about the man in the suit. Walking away, 666 remembers the power John Smith displayed. Frustration gives way to lamentation as 666 questions why she is weak. At Mitsugoshi Company headquarters, 664 concludes her report. Alpha is surprised to hear how three of their numbers were bested by a new opponent. As Gamma has no information on this John Smith, thinking he might be a first child of the cult of Diablos, Alpha postulates he might be a resident of the lawless city. But while the two leaders debate his origin, 666 interjects to clarify the strength of John Smith, much to the fright of 664 trying to keep her in line before their leaders. Panicked at the idea of punishment, 664 rushes 666 out of the office as 665 sings farewell to Alpha and Gamma. Resuming their briefing, Gamma updates Alpha that she assigned Zeta to search for an objective they previously discussed, with Alpha hoping Zeta's silence on reporting in is because her mission is progressing well, as Zeta concurrently overlooks her objective alongside her backup. With the cult holding a heavy resistance, Alpha voices wanting the fighting to finish soon so they can relax, worrying Gamma before deciding to send Delta to handle John Smith, with the Therianthrope ready to hunt. On a train leaving the lawless city, John Smith reviews his notebook before noticing the prowling Delta pursuing the train. She charges in breaching his cabin and her usual feral hunting, only for her attack to be halted by magical strings as John Smith casually holsters his notebook to continue fighting her. As Delta dodges the string attacks, she roars with enough force to rupture the train cabin outward, but John Smith immediately takes advantage of the debris to pin her down under the rubble. As John Smith stands above her to deliver a villainous monologue, Delta turns from raging to inquisitive upon smelling him so close, then jumps playfully once she realizes he's actually her master, Shadow. Sid is dejected that Delta found out and ruined his roleplay, but he gets over it to give her a back ride to another train cabin. Sid asks why Delta was there and she confirms she was ordered by Alpha to hunt John Smith, only to realize Sid is John Smith, so she knows she can't beat him. Stopping her from reporting back to Alpha, Sid tells her that she cannot tell Alpha because he's in the middle of a secret mission. While Delta playfully asks to accompany him, Sid declines as the mission is something only he can do, and it could end in failure if she reports back to Alpha. But as Delta is conflicted since she's on a mission for Alpha, Sid reminds her that his authority overrides Alpha so he gives her a special mission instead, promising a reward, within reason and his abilities, an excited Delta. Breaking off the window, Sid brings Delta to the opening and directs her to the lawless city to hunt Juggernaut at his Black Tower. Delta reviews her assignment, Sid reminds her that the reward will be under his conditions, and she gleefully races off. Exasperated, Sid worries about the situation and thinks about Alpha, but is sure that Delta will be home once the weather is warm enough. The next day, Gamma reports how their scouts found the battle scene of the train along with Delta's bell ornament from her tail, cracked and broken. Alpha is shocked as Gamma fears the worst, as both know Delta would never abandon a mission. Alpha orders the search to continue, if at least to find her presumed dead body, cracking the window in quiet rage. 
as GAM informs her of the continuation of counterfeit bills flooding the market, more than the assets needed to redeem the value for the bills, Alpha now believes John Smith planned for the credit collapse, wiping out the major corporate alliance and Mitsugoshi distracted by their commerce war, and take what remained for himself. Gamma is stunned that such a man would be ambitious enough to have the market constantly generate profit for himself, while Alpha's rage reaches its peak and her mana begins to manifest in a blue flame. In Garter's office, Getten meets with two agents of the cult, relaying the organization's concerns about the credit collapse and the cult losing substantial holdings. As one of the agents jests about Getten's personal relationship, he is decapitated in the blink of an eye by the still-seated Getten, leaving the other agents startled. When Getten inquires if John Smith is the mastermind, the remaining agent affirms that their investigation led to John Smith, who stopped them from ceasing his counterfeit operation. Getten then orders Garter to institute inspection checkpoints at any exit from the royal capital. However, Garter attempts to clarify that, while they have clout with the city operations, the royals and knight orders will turn against them, prompting Getten to kill the remaining agent to convince Garter to do as he is told. Getten orders Garter to do whatever he must to find the source of the counterfeit bills, and the scared Garter complies. Public sentiment starts to turn against Garter and the MCA over the checkpoints, with the Minister of Transportation and Night Orders growing incensed by the overreach from Merchant Alliance. As Iris walks home from training, she encounters Alexia with a stack of books around the castle grounds. Surprised considering her sister is out of school, Alexia clarifies that the academy is still under reconstruction, and she thought it would be easier to find specialized books in the palace archives pertaining to various social studies. While Iris questions if her sister is reconsidering being a scholar, Alexia explains that she wishes to hone her mind to know better where to swing her blade. Since what has happened since the spring earlier this year, Alexia now knows that swinging her sword at random accomplishes nothing and will make her an outsider. Alexia concludes that, in order to wield her sword in a place that matters, she must earn the right to stand there by starting somewhere she doesn't necessarily have to wield a sword. A hard-earned lesson. As Alexia mentioned she hardly has any time for anything else outside of training, Iris quickly and quietly walks off, much to her sister's confusion. In Sid's apartment, Beta is recounting how the counterfeit bills are affecting the capital's economy, with Shadow sneezing due to the cold air despite keeping a fire pot beside him. Beta elaborates more that the royal family will take action soon and Garter's imposed checkpoints actually worsen the economy, but stops to ask if Shadow was taking notes. He confirms as much, saying it will affect the future but he mutters not understanding something after Beta continues how the inflation now compels a state-level response, prompting her to apologize for confusing her master and willing to restart the investigation. Shadow orders she continues while placing his hands over his fire pot to keep warm, and she sadly brings up no contact with Delta and is presumed dead, perplexing Shadow as to why she hasn't returned yet. Beta begins to bring up more information, but Shadow excuses himself under the pretext of other matters, until she asks if he took notes. Per Shadow Garden regulations, all documents are to be encrypted or destroyed, but Shadow shows her the notes and she is amazed by the complexity of the unrecognized language. Shadow boasts he developed a coded method using five languages he developed, gifting Beta a page to decrypt to learn some of his wisdom. Elsewhere, John Smith reads his notes from Beta's report as Natsu informs him that the train is approaching the NCA checkpoint, prompting him to put his notebook away. At the checkpoint, one of the NCA members asks if they can really enforce a checkpoint while his senior colleague reminds him of their orders to stop them or give them an accident. While the junior member voices how the knights would stop them soon enough, the senior member shouts how they have no choice lest their black market lives end. Frustrated, the junior member summarizes Garter's role as nothing more than a simple merchant, while the senior member is more afraid of whom Garter answers to. As the train nears, the checkpoint is effortlessly destroyed and the train unimpeded, prompting the senior member to hope they can go into hiding without being found by those monsters. With John Smith atop the nose of the train, he sees a figure in a shaded silhouette and is met by Alpha who greets him before a sudden farewell. However, John Smith counters and pushes her into a defensive stance, with Alpha slowly realizing he is shadowed by his skill and technique. A devastated Alpha demands he explain himself only for Shadow to claim he had forsaken his name for John Smith, confusing her even more as she demands to know what has happened to Delta. Darting his eyes behind his tinted mask to quietly improvise an excuse, John Smith tells the truth that he sent Delta to a far-off place. Angered at an evasive answer, 
Alpha blazes with her magical energy as she retorts that his statement tells her nothing. Voicing how she can't understand what he does, Alpha still confesses that she wishes to be there for him to help the man who saved her life and asks if he doesn't need her anymore. John Smith evades the question by telling her that she'll soon see that this is the best choice, but Alpha swears she won't keep dragging him down and activates her new powers. Although John Smith moves to restrain her, Alpha can replicate the vampire mist form and eludes his magic threads. Alpha puts up a resistance, stating that she can still support him as she moves in for an attack. However, Sid catches her blade by the tip and explains that while enemy attacks cannot land, she can just as easily dodge, and the major weakness of solidifying to attack isn't enough for turn on the risk. Yet while her mist form is cool for flying, he points out that being mist reduces her mass, rendering her to intense blowback effects. Sid resumes his John Smith persona to use a tiger kung fu stance, shattering the train car windows upon stomping his foot and channeling the force of his footwork into an iron palm thrust. Alpha resolidifies, reaching out in vain to catch up to her mentor, only to land on the tracks as the train marches on and crying in the snow for him not to leave her. At the abandoned mine, Yukim shows John Smith the hordes of gold collected from their counterfeiting operation, having drained the major corporate alliance of all their reserves. Yukim also apprises John Smith that she has been concurrently gathering authentic banknotes, planning to cash them for the public to see how the NCA is insolvent causing a credit crisis and destroying the alliance for good, with the ripple effect reaching Mitsugoshi as well. As the businesses that supported the Midgar Kingdom economy will systematically collapse, and when the government gets involved to quell the chaos, Yukim aims to destroy all the evidence leading to their operation and vanish without a trace. John Smith, sneakily citing Beta's report, concurs and notes how prices have increased, triggering inflation and forcing a response at the state level. Yukim is impressed by his foresight, and he retorts he cannot take all the credit, much to her flattery. Leaving their storehouse by train, Yukim brings up what she told him before three, about her youth in her small village. Yukim narrates how when the great hero Shiva fell in battle, the various mighty clans warred for his crown, which had her spirit fox clan at their mercy. To survive, the spirit foxes forged an alliance with other like-minded clans, thus the spirit foxes made an alliance with the great wolves. Being the daughter of the only three-tailed fox, Yukim was betrothed to Geten, son of the great wolves patriarch. The two were joyous and were happy in their company, as well as their peoples were celebratory to their union. But the war between two neighboring clans spilled over and destroyed their village, rendering the wisdom and strength of the lesser clans to nothing. However, Geten had made a bargain for more power using red pills, but Yukima's mother refused such a measure and the villagers followed suit in the faith in her judgment. Geton angrily jeered her choice as his path could have stopped all the bloodshed and confessed to killing her to protect Yukim from the war. However, Yukim rejected him and retaliated, leading to a wrathful Geton slicing her back and leaving her barely alive. When he departed in pursuit of power, a barely cogent Yukim heard him succumb to injury by an undiscerned source. After losing her village, Geton became Yukim's art nemesis as she lived as a prostitute to survive, learning and slowly acquiring power until she rose to become queen of the White Tower in the lawless city. Yukim asks if John Smith realized her true motives now, not to build a fortune but to bring Geton down and end him. However, in Sid's usual distracted mindset, he was wondering if circumstances were similar to someone else. Planning to conclude her story with Geton, Yukim bids John Smith farewell and hopes he'll await her return trusting her to be successful. Back in the lawless city, Delta howls in the night over the raging inferno where the Black Tower once stood. The circulation of counterfeits has destroyed public confidence in the major corporate alliance banknotes. Citizens in the royal capital find paying for commodities increasingly challenging as more businesses refuse MCA's paper money. Exchange for gold is likewise becoming difficult as liquid assets dwindle. Mitsugoshi Company's notaries have remained legal tender, but trust has diminished. As thousands of citizens form lines outside Mitsugoshi's main bank, morale is low in the higher ranks of Shadow Garden. Gamma gazes at the forming crowd. After closing the curtain, she falls into silent contemplation. Ida's solemn eyes decipher Shadow's coded message, while Beta and Nu discuss the company's monetary projections. Their worry soon pauses the conversation, and they gaze dejectedly at a room. Alpha has isolated in the main office after learning John Smith was Shadow. Curled into a ball by the fireplace, she laments the perceived betrayal. Outside an NCA bank branch, men in suits load suitcases of gold coins into a carriage. 
A bystander comments that they have been seen redeeming banknotes at other bank affiliates. The citizens gaze back at the bank, only to find a locked door and a closed sign, escalating the already elevated distrust of paper currency. Yukime savors the result from afar and walks away from the disgruntled mob. As the situation continues to spiral, Getin demands answers from Garter. He informs the lycanthrope warrior the source of the counterfeits remains an enigma, but Yukime is the mastermind. Garter elaborates that carriages transporting exchanged gold were identified as Snow Fox Corporation vehicles. The company acts as a front for the White Tower, and the wagon's conveyance of gold coins follows an identical route as the counterfeit bills. An incredulous Getin tries to rationalize the revelation, knowing Yukime turned to prostitution to survive. The sound of the bell startles Getin out of contemplation. Garter, lacking the therianthrope senses, questions his sudden reaction. Getin senses her formidable presence amid the crowd. He clutches his pocket watch, adorned with a braided lanyard and bells, and orders the carriage to stop. The situation has not changed at the Mitsugoshi Company's headquarters as Gamma watches over a despondent Alpha. Gamma updates her about the NCA closing storefronts due to insolvency. Citizens' unrest has reached a boiling point, and bank riots are breaking out. Customers are also racing to Mitsugoshi banks to exchange what they can for gold, overwhelming their company cashiers. Liquid reserves are proving inadequate for the exigency. Gamma reports they only have a few days left before their vaults are devoid of gold, adding their domestic and foreign assets would not stave off a credit collapse. A projected graph new receives confirms the situation. A steady upward trajectory turns into a steep decline. Gamma suggests plans to stop the escalating bank run, like showing enormous stacks of gold to placate public anxiety. But Alpha dismisses the idea. Shadow was John Smith. He instigated the credit crisis, which must have been what he wanted. Gamma denies Shadow abandoning them, but Alpha rationalizes the situation differently. Even with all the wisdom and resources he shared, they did not meet his expectations, thus he discarded them. As Alpha recalls her pledge to Shadow, a crestfallen Gamma slumps to the floor. If that is what you wish, I will give you my life. New enters, finding the two leaders in a depression. She chooses to begin her report regardless of the room's atmosphere. Investigations revealed solid evidence that Getin was a cult of Diablo's agent who conspired to circulate counterfeit bills in a plot to bankrupt Mitsugoshi. Gamma satirically expresses flattery as the cult saw Mitsugoshi as a threat without knowing their secret affiliation with Shadow Garden. Shadow foresaw the plan and took advantage of the company's economic warfare. Gamma's comments prompt Alpha to have an epiphany. The cult of Diablo's objective of circulating the counterfeits had not commenced. Instead, Shadow took the initiative. Shadow created the whole scenario by distributing the counterfeits under an alias while cutting off contact, but Alpha is unsure of the purpose. Interrupting Alpha's cogitation, Bet enters with news that they successfully cracked Shadow's code and offers the translated message. Reading it, Alpha joyously sheds tears and sniffles that their master did not abandon them. In the note, Shadow clarifies that he has turned traitor. He has to forsake his name and begin printing counterfeit bills with an accomplice to bring his plan to fruition. All the gold exchanged for counterfeit NCA notes is stored where his sister was previously held captive. Shadow concluded they might resent him for it, but he maintains that his choice was for the best. The trio expresses joy and marvels at Shadow's ingenious stratagem and remarkable foresight. To counter the cult's plot against Mitsugoshi, he utilized their scheme against them. He collected a tremendous fortune for them to survive the economic crisis. The cult will lose the MCA for a financial and trade partner. Beta attests that the cult chose the wrong battle because Shadow's comprehension of credit creation is unrivaled. Gamma praises his bold effort to collect the funds, conscious of the precariousness of a credit collapse. Shadow concealed his identity to remove any traceable connections from the counterfeit banknotes. It hid the link between the Mitsugoshi Company and Shadow Garden. Beta concludes that Shadow chose a spot they were familiar with to mark where they would need to go to recover their gains. In fooling your enemies, first deceive your allies. All that remains is the retrieval of the gold. Alpha recalls how he told her she would understand when his plan was finalized and that it was the best option. She concludes that he was correct. Gamma hesitatingly asks after Delta, but Alpha reassures them not to worry and calls to an open window. Delta's ears and then face slowly make an appearance. Beta and Gamma hug her as Delta tries to justify her absence. Delta begins to clarify that she was on a confidential mission for Shadow, but stops the explanation. The information is a secret. 
Alpha tenderly reproved her grammar, as Sid would not use redundant compound adjectives. The trio continues to hug her, much to Delta's confusion. That evening, John Smith rhapsodically slaughters more men looking into the counterfeit production. Loan overtime work without proper remuneration is of no consequence. UK may express no interest in monetary gains, and Sid is welcome to keep all the profit. Returning to the cave, Sid contemplates shadow broker scenarios as he prepares to conclude the operation. The leading idea is standing on a clock tower and murmuring profound but meaningless words. Eminence's daydreams cease as an empty room greets him. A heavy silence befalls the area. Yukum's attendants, Natsu and Kana, break the silence with pattering feet. They rush into the room, announcing they have lost contact with Yukime. John Smith tunes out their words, pondering how such a heist could have occurred. At the mention of Getten, he suddenly turns his head, silencing the pair. The masked gentleman maniacally laughs, perceiving Getten as the perpetrator. The empty jail cell finally attracts the notice of Therianthropes, but Kana thinks it is hasty to assume Getten is the perpetrator. John Smith's mana blazes in a rage, frightening the girls and cutting off any more conversations. He proclaims that Getten will return what is precious to him. Citizens-led riots continue to escalate in the royal capital. NCA banknotes are now being used as kindling over large street bonfires. Uninterested in the turmoil, Getten collapses, having been mortally wounded by Yukime's war fans, Tessens. Her golden-haired, nine-tailed fox technique overwhelms the warrior. Getten frustratingly croaks that things would be different if he had that power. Nothing would have been taken from him. Frustration turns to anger as Getten voices Yukime's unjustified betrayal, turning against him. As he rants about how he could do more with money and power, Yukime confesses that something unknown has altered him. Regardless of evolution and the murder of Yukime's mother, Getten once saved her and the village. There are vestiges of hope that the man she knew remains inside Getten. She concludes their battle with those words, sparing Getten's life. Perceiving Yukime's departure as ridicule, Getten retrieves a vial of red pills from his pocket. Consuming one, he gains a power boost and uses his snap blade to cut Yukime's back. As his eyes regrow, a bloodthirsty Getten declares he should have killed her back then. Gazing at Yukime's lacerated back with regained sight reminds Getten of that day he murdered her mother. A traumatic episode overtakes Getten, but he pushes through to finish her. A timely attack from John Smith interrupts the coup de grace. A stunned Yukime sees John interposing himself between herself and her oppressor. Getten mocks him for coming into the open, but John Smith does not replay the taunt. Clashing with Getten's blade, the masked fighter states he is there to retrieve something precious to him. Getten thinks the special item means Yukime, recalling how she was before his treachery. John Smith exclaims he knows Getten is the one who stole from him and reiterates his reclaim of his precious thing. Getten roars that his claims are hypocritical, and he would not feign ignorance. As their fight rages around the snow embankment, Yukime retrieves Getten's pocket watch, thinking how it would have been simpler for John Smith to abandon her. His ambiguous declaration of something very precious leads Yukun to the same conclusion Getten reached. Yukime's reflection on his compassion halts when Getten is sent flying past her, bloodied by John Smith's wrathful assault. John Smith demands that Getten voice the truth, but Getten refutes his demand, claiming he has nothing to say. Getten tries to swallow the rest of the pills in the bottle, but Getten's actions are again interrupted by John Smith. A swift stomp in Getten's mouth is followed by another demand for Getten to talk. Every refusal to speak is punished with another beating. John Smith's obscene power makes Getten recall the masked monster who took his eyesight years ago. He starts to weep, confessing that all he ever wanted was the power to protect. The moribund Getten points to Yukime and entrusts his precious treasure to John Smith in his last breath. The masked fighter tells the now dead Getten his treasure will be in good hands as he hugs Yukime to heal her wound. Yukime weakly trundles over to her savior and collapses in his arms. Embracing the wounded woman, John Smith administers first aid, healing her wound. The magic coursing through her body is reminiscent of someone who healed her when her village was destroyed. Yukime suddenly realizes that the suit-wearing healer is the boy who saved her life and tearfully thanks him for all he has done. The only response is a question regarding whether Getten said it was under the snow. Inside the capital, the collapse of the major corporate alliance has mandated official intervention. Iris Midgar and the Crimson Order raid the NCA vault only to find it empty. As Garter attempts to make excuses, Iris orders Marco Granger to arrest Garter. 
a few of his crimes are disrupting the market and offensive actions against the Royal Distribution Network. Iris walks away, as severity to her gaze. Yukime returns to a worried Kana and Natsu. They question the whereabouts of John Smith. Grasping Getin's pocket watch and bell lanyard, Yukime explains that he has gone to give him a proper burial. Yukime is similarly confused at the empty storeroom as a dark figure emerges from the shadows. Alpha formally introduces herself as Kana and Natsu stand guard, but Yukime waves them down. Alpha sees Yukime's confusion and confesses to Shadow's compartmentalization. She hands the spirit fox a letter belonging to Getin. Shadow Garden sees relevant documents before the royal investigation into the NCA dissolution. Yukime tells Alpha that the handwriting is sloppy but is not necessarily due to Getin's eyesight. In their youth, she often acted as his scribe due to his penmanship and inability to sit at a desk. Alpha elaborates how the cult of Diablos is responsible for Getin's change, taking advantage of his weaknesses. Shadow is at war with them, and Shadow Garden is supporting his efforts. Alpha surprises Yukime by revealing how Mitsugoshi Company is the public front of Shadow Garden. Yukime successfully deduces that all her gold will be used to survive the credit crisis. Alpha understands if Yukime wishes to feel betrayed by this revelation, and Shadow is ready to bear responsibility. The Spirit Fox instead expresses only gratitude and accepts Alpha's proposition to join their ranks. The Mitsugoshi Company would continue to handle public associations, and the Snow Fox Corporation would act as a liaison for the underworld. Thanks to the new funds, Towers of Gold greet the anxious customers as Gamma and her staff exchange coins for bills. The Mountain of Gold and the irreproachable exchange process has restored public trust in the Mitsugoshi Company. Sid continues digging for the gold he thought Getin had buried in the snow. His happy ending seemed just in his grasp, but now the money is missing, Mitsugoshi is stable, and Yukime is quiet. Delta helps him dig and pesters him to honor his promise to do what she wants. Sid retorts that he promised to do anything within his abilities and wishes he had a voice recorder to prove she was lying. At Delta's confusion, Sid clarifies that a voice recorder is a weapon of the shadows and could destroy the world, shocking the Therian throat. Sid compromises but cannot guarantee anything as he is not Santa Claus. Sid describes Santa Claus as a fiendish demon lord in red who betrays people's dreams. Those crushed dreams and despair are used to paint his robe red. Delta expresses alarm at this revelation. Sid explains that he was not immune to the Red Demon Lord's powers. Santa betrayed him because his dream never came true. Delta asks what his dream was, but Sid stops himself from revealing his eminence in Shadow Goal. Sid has decided never to tell people what matters to him. Circling back to the point, he is not Santa and cannot give her anything. Delta points out Santa does not give people what they want either. They come to a mutual agreement of not understanding each other and move on. Sid tells Delta he is departing on a journey. He wants her to think hard about what she would want from him, and to tell him once he returns. Sid's personal discovery journey is to give the women in his life some space. He believes they are furious with him. After they cool off, he will casually return after a suitable length of time without apologizing. It is Sid's secret technique for interpersonal relationships. Exhaust the other party until they give up. As he leaves, Delta discovers something and calls for Sid, only for him to be out of earshot and gone. Skell and Poe go to Sid's dorm room to invite him to accompany them to Mitsugoshi HQ to hit on the employees. However, they find Sid missing but discover six premium tickets for Mitsugoshi Hot Springs Land, and from their usual logic, they decide in their own favor to use the tickets to boost their chances of meeting ladies. They head over to Mitsugoshi, where they show New the tickets and ask her to join them only for New to turn from exhausted by their antics to perplexed by this, so she takes them inside Mitsugoshi's offices to interrogate them with a pair of employees polishing weapons for intimidation. She asks how they acquired the tickets, as the contents were delivered only to a chosen few, to which Skell and Poe were not among those names. They tell her that they got them from their friend, Sid, and that he asked them to invite Mitsugoshi employees. She asks to confirm if the Sid they are talking about is Sid Kaguna. The two claim as such, and that he gave them the tickets. Knowing Sid is her lord, Shadow, New surmises that he gave the tickets to his classmates for some purpose and has the numbers call a meeting with the Seven Shadows. She asks if Sid will be present in the hot spring, they affirm, and she takes her leave while asking they take their leave in a wrathful tone. In the conference room, they convene to deliberate on the motive behind Sid's cryptic message. 
Alpha discusses with the Seven Shadows and the rest of the named numbers what could be Shadow's plan to send his schoolmates to invite her on a date, before correcting herself and claiming it was for all of them. Ita proceeds to explain the origin of Mitsugoshi Hot Springs Land, inspired by a tale native to the area where the resort was built. In their earlier years, after completing a mission to quell the cult of Diablos, a dying adversary muttered to Shadow that he would never possess the dragon's golden tears. Intrigued, Shadow inquired with the other members, and Gam recalled a reference to the dragon's tears in a regional fable. This prompted Shadow to lead the group to start digging throughout the region for these elusive tears. After three days of digging, Shadow abruptly departed and left the girls to continue the excavation, during which Ida stumbled upon a hot spring. The Mitsugoshi Hot Springs land was subsequently established at that very location, but despite their efforts, they failed to detect any trace of dragon magic in the area. Hence, the impending trip to the hot springs was seen as an opportunity to uncover new information. As they debated on who would attend the hot springs excursion, as three tickets were for Sid and his friends, leaving another three tickets for a select trio among themselves. With disagreement, the subordinate members left to allow the leadership to resolve the debate, and a resolution was reached through a game of rock-paper-scissors. Consequently, Beta, Zeta, and Delta emerged as the chosen trio to embark on this quest for answers. At Mitsugoshi Hot Springs Land, the trio encounters Skell and Poe, but their anticipation is dampened by the absence of Sid. Frightened by their angered smiles, Poe offers reassurance that Sid is merely running late, alleviating their concerns as they begin to head inside. Despite the setback, Skell and Poe forge ahead with their date, attempting to apply insights gleaned from the book World's Best Love Tips, Your Heart-Pounding First Hot Springs Date Edition by Count Virgin Boy, albeit with the author's recorded little success. In the meantime, given how there's no battle or mission, Alpha speculates that Shadow's mission might have been to encourage them to unwind and take a reprieve for once in their five years of activity. Just as this notion circulates, Epsilon asks Chi and Omega if there is any trouble, but aside from Nu taking paid leave for the grand opening, Chi found no troubles. However, Ida arrives with a report disclosing the detection of an anomalous magical signature underground. In the female's only bath, Zeta contemplates the mission's purpose and can only conclude with the significance of the dragon's tears. Lambda proceeds to narrate a shadow play of the dragon's tears legend. Once upon a time there lived in the land a kind and gentle princess, who rescued a small dragon separated from its clutch. The princess and the dragon became friends and grew up together. But their peaceful and happy days were ended when war broke out. The dragon fought to protect the princess, fending off a hundred thousand soldiers despite being afflicted by deep wounds, but returned to find the capital in ruins. As the princess was about to breathe her last, the dragon implored her to open her eyes and begged they could soar through the skies together once more. As a tear fell from the princess's lifeless body, the dragon then began to weep uncontrollably until hot tears flooded the land, covering the entire kingdom. The princess awoke to find a mysterious hot spring filled with the essence of life, but the dragon was nowhere even as the princess called the dragon's name, and received no response. In the midst of the contemplative atmosphere within the female's only bath, Zeta speculates that the key to Shadow's objective may be concealed within the legend, while Beta complimented Lamba's performance. Meanwhile, Skell and Poe poorly attempt to discreetly observe the lady's bath, but Ida sprays their eyes with an eye-irritant mechanism. The unexpected result of their tears falling into the hot spring triggers a surge in magical energy. Replicating the effect on the boys proved fruitless. Connecting the legend to the princess's tears, Zeta formulates a hypothesis. Ida, seizing on this revelation, decides to employ Beta, the self-proclaimed lovely elven princess, as the source of tears. Employing a less than dignified tactic, Ida goads Beta until she succumbs to tears. As Beta's tears mingle with the hot spring, a seismic tremor courses through the land. With the event drawing public attention, Alpha and her group convene in the public area and find the water in the Mitsugoshi Hot Springs land main pool taking on a form of a dragon, prompting chaos. As Alpha ponders if this was what Shadow had meant, Beta and her group return as Gamma swiftly commands the Mitsugoshi employees to safely evacuate the guests. Adapting to the circumstances, the Shadows don white attire instead of their customary black, while Epsilon is initially confused to see themselves in colored versions of their uniforms, Ida applied spray colors out of necessity in concealing their true identities as members of the Shadow Garden. The dragon is confronted by the shadows, but Ida and Gamma fall behind, 
and Beta is taken captive as she is still hurt by Ida's words. Once the dragon is defeated by Alpha, a golden magic cascades like snow from above upon their victory, infusing the hot spring water with enchanting properties that improve beauty and health, such as skin quality and high blood pressure and more. While Beta continues to shed tears, the dragon's spirit tenderly licks them from her eyes before ascending into the sky. As they witness this ethereal spectacle, Alpha concludes Shadow's true intent was to rescue the dragon's soul, which had led him to dispatch them on this unforeseen mission. Afterward, Gamma and the Mitsugoshi staff entertain that the guests come back, claiming the event was staged for the opening and use it to sell limited edition merchandise to celebrate the resort's grand opening. As the guests buy the merchandise, Gamma is pleased by the profits while Alpha is pleased by the dragon's salvation. Inside the vendor stall, Nu recalls how she was on her day off, but is working the venue, to which Lambda just tells her to take a compensation day for her troubles, and the day continues as usual for everyone. Later in the evening, Skell and Poe head home, with no recollection of what happened from all the damage they took. However, Poe thinks that is a good sign as it fits with Count Virgin Boy's book, and they're on the right track to becoming men, as they cheer into the night. Sid's introspective journey has brought him to a small tavern in the Oriana Kingdom. The taverner, Marie, apologizes for the meager selection of drinks, explaining that soldiers seized expensive items to finance the war effort. Urban warfare has ruined the surrounding town, occasioning an unfortunate arrival time for her and Sid. Paying no mind to her concerns, Sid reminisces about his past actions. His journey started without direction, and the time allowed for a profound meditation of his eminence in Shadow Dream. His efforts have been largely reactionary, performing in whatever seemed eminence in shadowy in any situation. Sid wonders if he should continue that path, orally commenting, can things really go on like this? Marie, engaged in food preparation, misinterprets the rhetorical question as a reply to the previous conversation. Agreeing, she declares they must not give in to the situation. Marie sets her resolve aside to focus on a patron, handing her the completed sandwich. Before the customer puts the plate down, a nearby hand seizes half of her meal. 665 takes a large bite, ignoring 664's reprimands. Marie quickly promises to make another sandwich. Rose is not with her teammates and has remained in her lodgings, as she whimpers an apology to the empty room. Vivid hallucinations of patricide run through her mind. Keen Oriana grips Rose's rapier with a bloodied hand, using his last breath to call her choice unforgivable. The cold eyes of her father roused Rose from the nightmare. Lying in bed, Rose returns to her senses. The princess glances through the window, commenting on the destruction of First Castle Town. Joining Shadow Garden was to gain strength and rescue her kingdom. A knock on the door interrupts her thoughts minus 664 announces their departure, followed by 665's ebullient encouragement. Departing from the tavern, 664 explains she will not be in charge of the mission. The operation commander is 559, a distinguished Shadow Garden member whose previous victory over 89 has granted her the right to challenge the named numbers. 664 notices 666 preoccupied musings and offers to discuss her thoughts. 666 politely declines, explaining there is nothing. The gluttonous 665 forces 664 to begrudgingly accept the unsatisfactory answer to stop her massive appetite. The three arrive at the rendezvous after nightfall. 559, already present, skips the pleasantries and asks if the trio were briefed about the mission. She sighs after hearing a negative and begins to explain the specifics. Perv's faction besieged the small case town two days ago. Such an insignificant location should have no strategic value. However, the cult of Diablos dispatched named children, their strongest troops, to conquer the area. Their objective is to discover the cult's intentions. 559 pulls 666 attention away from the dead royalist soldiers and asks if she knows the reason for her inclusion. 666 speculates it is her intimate knowledge of the area. The assumption is correct, but 559 clarifies that was the only reason. 559 confesses that Rose's presence, using 666's birth name, was a special request made by her. Rose's power was given to her by Shadow. Her teammates explain that the Seven Shadows empowered everyone, the only exception being the Seven Shadows themselves. 559 corrects their explanation, saying she, too, was graded power by Lord Shadow, calling Rose weak despite receiving such a blessing. 
The Devout 559 will eliminate anyone undeserving of Shadow's power. Movement on the ground halts her fanaticism, and everyone focuses on the road. Dozens of carriages head in the direction of repurposed ruins. What was once a war memorial to soldiers' sacrifice against Diablos became an amphitheater. The four women squad quickly follows behind and begin observing their activities. They discover the cult leader Koedoe, the Gale, and a large assembly of first children. Koedoe inserts a card into a pedestal, reminiscent of the key cards used in Sanctuary's laboratories. The subsequent illumination of the pedestal and surrounding area signifies a connection. 666 is shocked by the sudden appearance of her mother, Reina Oriana. The queen places her hand on a runic circle at Koedoe's behest, unlocking the sealed contents, a ring affiliated with Hero Freya. 559 recognizes the relic and tells the other to prepare for combat. She gives cursory answers to her teammates' questions, calling it the key. Reclamation is the new priority, shifting the mission from reconnaissance to assault. 666 begs 559 to reconsider the decision due to her mother's presence. The commander ignores her pleading and chooses the queen as her first target. Rose parries the strike, asking for an explanation. Elaboration is not the attacker's objective, and she receives no answer. The queen recognizes her daughter and hurriedly falls on her for support. 559, unimpressed with the spectacle, pivots to break the sword lock and transfers the momentum into a right hook. The attack hits Rose's face, sending her and Queen Oriana tumbling, but the enclosing cult members inhibit further assault. Rose's treachery confirms for 559 her unworthiness of servitude. Undeterred by the cult's children, she delves into the throng to assassinate the traitor. In Migger's capital, new reports to Gamma that the first castle surveillance team has engaged the enemy. The lounging Gamma acknowledges the report. 559 overzealous behavior is nothing new. Hearing that Rose encountered her mother and Pervash Shat was absent, Gamma wonders if it was all a trap. Shadow's Garden's interface has not uncovered Mordred, the ninth seed of the round. He is the puppet master behind the Oriana Kingdom's circumstances. Gamma accepts the situation and continues to glance at a newspaper. Princess Rose's return is the leading article. Mordred patience is not shared amongst his subordinates. Perv Ashat's anxiety is apparent. The civil unrest and Shadow Garden's continuous harassment have thinned his troops. Oriana Kingdom's security has significantly reduced, making it a perfect time to strike. Gamma orders Nu to deploy numerous troops and leave Rose to the cult. Shadow has set up present circumstances, but Gamma still questions how it will end. Back at the tavern, Sid is pondering the present situation. There is a succession battle between the Royalists and the Purr faction. He is confident that an eminence and shadow opportunity will present. Sid's idea is that an unknown figure emerges, ending the dispute by guiding one faction to victory. Rose seems like an ideal candidate. His uncertainty about her recent regicide gave him pause. His first thought was a betruffle dispute, however, her resolve was one of conviction to do whatever it took to be queen. Sid will help Rose's tyrannical ambitions and make her the next monarch. After becoming a despot, she will inevitably be a roadblock for the heroes. The eminence and shadow will stop the evil queen, putting aside past emotional attachments. Marie's waitressing is interrupted by the sound of the door slamming open. Three menacing men announce it is the war effort collection time. Marie protests their demands, reminding them she gave everything not too long ago. Watching their argument, Sid views it as a perfect opportunity to return to his roots. One of the intruders suggests that her body could be an alternative form of payment. Mob Sid screams, stuttering at them to stop. The three men beat Sid and take their spoils, paying no heed to the crumpled boy. Marie begs Sid not to be so reckless. She kindly smiles at his apology. An ex-prostitute from the lawless city is familiar with the feeling of despair. Ultimately, she received help from him and now she received help from Sid. Sid says his final goodbyes to Marie, declining to stay longer. She refuses his attempt to pay, stating that he saved her, and they part ways. The plot contriving mind of Sid's is already in motion. He is impressed with the three soldiers' performance, but refuses to be outdone by them. Over the next few days, Sid tried to realize the birth of Triant Rose without success. He purposefully got locked up in a corrections facility to try out the life of a prisoner. The convicts found themselves making an explosive jailbreak. Freeman Sid immediately joined a volunteer army and went on a near-suicidal expedition. Sid helped from the shadows by mimicking an Oriana legend, 
some older men got all the credit in validating all his efforts. To be a proper fixer, one must stand out by not standing out when standing out. A glow from a nearby ruined house offers shelter for three men, the exploitative soldiers from Marie's Tavern. Surrounded by loot, they comment on the wise selection of locations. The lost ground on the western front and the reappearance of legends make other postings less profitable. There was a rumor about recently discovered treasure on the other side of the mountain. A voice asks for details, but the soldier warns that asking questions is a poor decision. Blood slowly trickles out of his comrades' bodies as he obliviously explains that departing is to their advantage. He suggests adding a few women to their possessions and proposes Marie as a start. The only response is the sound of rummaging from a black-haired boy. Noticing his dead allies, the man jumps up and demands an explanation. The intruder jovially explains that if one covets something, taking it is acceptable, even through murder. Dropping a bag of gold into a duffel bag, he says lawless city rules are delightful. Might makes right would make his actions acceptable. The last thing the soldier sees is a black tendril whipping toward his face. A bloody Sid begins to leave, but he stops and looks back, his red eyes glowing in the dark. Marie's account balance is woefully inadequate for demand. If she disregards rent, there are insufficient funds to replenish stock for the next day. It would have been better to ask Sid to pay, dignity notwithstanding. She supposes that in the end, she must fall back on selling her body. Marie abruptly stands from a muffled sound outside her door. Cautiously, she opens the door and discovers a bag of gold coins. A gust of wind gives her a glimpse of a man in an ebony. The wind's intensity forces Marie to close her eyes. He is gone the next time she opens them. Gazing down at the gold, she tearfully thanks Shadow for watching over her all this time. Under the full moon, 559 dismembers a named child. Kuodaway the gale articulates his amazement at the death of heat blast, windstorm, dry wind, and cool breeze under her sword. She fought continuously for three days and nights, her strength decimating all his first named children forces. Kuodaway recognizes she has reached her limit and knocks 559 to the ground. A simple death cannot quell his anger. He will make sure she and her teammates die from torture. His losses will be worth it. With the acquisition of the key and Rose Oriana, he can surpass Perv Ashat and become the next knight of the rounds. A black figure against the moon brings a crazed smile to the moribund female warrior's face. She euphorically shouts that her savior has arrived. Purple magic enshrouds 559's body, and she moans in ecstasy. Kuodoi is incredulous as her severed left arm regenerates. With newfound strength, 559 turns the last man standing into red slime. Blood rains down as 559 voices her profound admiration and desire for shadow. 664 and 665 thankfully gaze over their healed wounds, questioning the appearance of their lord. 559 cheerfully greets the slowly deciding shadow. He starts to ask about the treasure's whereabouts but quickly switches to ruins mid-sentence. 559 falls to one knee to report 666 betrayal. Not catching his slight confusion, 559 declares her unworthy and requests the right to assassinate her. 664 and 665 come to their teammate's defense, clarifying that it was to protect her mother. Interpreting it as corporate espionage, Shadow ignores their squabble, having had enough commercial and traitorous shenanigans. A newspaper article with the headline Princess Rose announces marriage to Chancellor Ashat lands in his hands. Shadow mana explodes around him, inducing an ecstatic look from 559 and an anxious look from Rose's teammates. Before 664 can protest, Shadow blasts off into the air. Soaring through the air, he fears the eminence and Shadow performance will be compromised. If Rose marries, her purpose of becoming a tyrannist will be lost. He disappears into a purple glint, shouting to the absent Rose that he will pursue her. Lambda walks out of the bus to allow the rest of the girls out. Chai and Omega call for her and Omega asks if that was all for the additional troops since Lambda was there. Lambda negates Omega's statement and says she has one more batch to take care of. She was there solely to confirm something from the people on site. Omega demands what she's there to confirm to which the woman replies that it was about number 666. The number refers to Princess Rose, Oriana, and Lambda believes that the princess betrayed them and has become one of the enemies now. But Chai thinks that things turned out to work that way and Omega stands with him. He says that calling what she did betrayal would be a little too much. 
Lambda couldn't say anything to that but still stands firm with the fact that Princess Rose turned her back on her teammates. The girl seems to be really hurt because she was her instructor and the princess disobeyed her. Lambda wants to decide judgment for number 666 herself, but considering the situation right now, that wouldn't be possible anymore because even Seven Shadows can't do that. That puts Lambda in a state of shock, and that's when she realizes Lord Shadow will decide the princess's judgment himself. And considering how merciless Lord Shadow is, things don't look pretty. Omega and Chi make it crystal clear that no one has any authority over Princess Rose's decision, and Lambda can't do anything but accept it. Lord Shadow Aka Sid is walking around the town, eating some snacks and eavesdropping the conversations of the locals. Businesses are going down and people are disappointed in the princess who murdered her own father. Everyone sees her in an evil light and believes that she must pay for all the chaos she caused. Sid turns his snack into ash, using his powers and talks to himself how cool it would be if Princess Rose Oriana's marriage gets cancelled. He is so ready to make an iconic comeback, but appearing from the sky won't look as amazing in broad daylight. So he plans to hop over the gate and show off his teleportation skills. As he is about to bring that plan to action, Epsilon calls Sid from the back. Sid stops there and looks back to coincidentally find his teacher there. She asks Sid if he was there for the problem. They seem to be talking in codes to prevent any royalty issue. Anyway, Sid tells Epsilon that he was there for the problem and thinks Epsilon happened to be there at the right time. The woman gets flattered and says it's all thanks to the powers Sid gave her that she can be of some help now. She finds it amazing how indistinct the country is towards everyone when it comes to art. Epsilon keeps on talking while they walk through the royal palace and according to Epsilon, she can do so because of Lord Shadow. Sid reminds her of piano so she thanks him for making her the best piano player. Epsilon keeps making her breasts touch Sid's body, and he figures that they are 99% slime. He finds out that the woman is trying to shake them with the help of intricate magic control. He goes on to describe how Epsilon is going as far as to incorporate chaos theory into her fake shakes and overdoing everything. Epsilon keeps on walking weirdly, and Sid's silence makes her question if something was on his mind. Sid is smart with everything and flatters her by saying that he's thinking of the fruit of her efforts. He's clearly thinking of some different fruit there. Epsilon whispers in Sid's ears and says that all of her spies are keeping an eye on their target, which is again, Princess Rose. As she is talking to Sid, someone calls her from behind, and she recognizes the man instantly. It was Duke Perv Ashat who's standing there with a bunch of other men behind him. He asks the girl if she is going to perform for them at luncheon. He was right, Epsilon was there to make her new piano piece known by performing there. Duke Perv compliments her work and the woman hopes her music brings comfort to the grieving soul of Princess Rose who is mourning the death of the king, her father. Princess Rose's fiance apologizes to Epsilon saying that the princess won't be attending her performance due to her condition. Duke's duchess start to laugh and Epsilon, with intended irony, says that it must be hard for Duke considering the situation. The man takes it too seriously and starts blabbering about being the great husband. Meanwhile, Sid is busy reading right through the Duke pervert. Sid believes that Duke Perv Ashat is living inside an evil mold. He thinks how hard it must have been for the dude to acquire such a name. Duke then notices Sid and asks Epsilon who he is. She tells him that Sid is her most favorite student whom she cherishes a lot. The NPCs in the back get shocked to hear that and Epsilon tells them that she and Sid share a secretive relationship. Duke then humbly asks the woman if Sid is allowed to enter the royal palace. Epsilon assumed that bringing a guest in wouldn't cause any problem but the protocol for the place had been changed. Epsilon asks if they'll need to reschedule but Duke had a solution to their problem. He says that Sid will be allowed in if he plays a piece for the people there. Like that, he'll get to see how talented Epsilon's student Sid actually is. All the while, Sid is in his own delusional world and likes how coolly Duke plays the role of a villain. He admires his spirit and thinks he'll shock the villain just as much by being the great pianist of a background character. The royal people express their surprise after finding out Epsilon had a student, and they have great expectations towards the guy. Sid notices how packed with jewels the rich people there were and he compares them to regular citizens who are barely living through the chaos. He finds it all unfair and wants to avenge the poor citizens for what they've been going through all along. Then a maid sees Sid playing piano and gets completely lost in him. Lord Shadow's piano skills amaze the audience and find his piece to be really beautiful. Epsilon is busy capturing Sid on the stage with tears in her eyes too. While everyone is busy watching and complimenting the guy performing on the stage, 
Sid magically steals all the expensive jewels from the men. He then finishes his part and stands up to receive applause from the audience. Epsilon is crying tears of joy and says that everyone has finally experienced the real Moonlight Sonata. Epsilon says some words of compliments for Sid while he silently steals the riches. Duke Perv Ashat was impressed by Sid's piano skills too and couldn't resist asking him his name. As Sid is about to introduce himself, Epsilon barges in and says that the guy can't introduce himself since he's still a student. She will allow him to reveal his name after he's done with his education. Duke says that everyone in the hall is going crazy over the dude and wants to know his name. Epsilon says the guy isn't allowed to do any of that at the moment. Sid, on the other hand, is busy observing Duke's pocket. He can sense something inside so he uses his magic to look through. He sees a ring shining inside which is most likely the wedding ring reserved for Princess Rose. Duke and his NPCs are busy conversing with Epsilon and Sid seizes that chance to get his hands over that very ring as well. He gets all the jewels out to show them to Epsilon Aka Master Sharon and tells her that he will go out to look around the palace more. Epsilon knows what he's up to so she smirks and allows him to do whatever he can since this is the right opportunity. Then the same maid from earlier comes in and offers to show Sid around the place. She doesn't give the guy a second to refuse her offer and introduces herself as Maid Margaret. She mentions Princess Rose and Sid's ears catch up on that really quickly. The maid hovers over Sid, practically forcing him to join her and see all the new places. Sid didn't want to join her, but when he noticed that Maid Margaret's breasts were not all slime unlike Epsilon's, he gave in. The two are walking through a garden and Sid mentions the weather after seeing the flowers. The maid tells him that an artifact keeps the temperature warm in winters and grabs Sid's arm to glue her breasts to his body. She keeps on talking and mentions how much she loved his performance earlier. She talks without taking a second breath and Sid is busy talking to himself in his mind. He says that the people of this world find his skills to be magical since he's from modern Japan. The maid mentions how early Patron is keeping his eyes on Sid and becoming his personal pianist will earn him 100 million zini per year. Sid asks if the salaries are yearly there, and Margaret mentions another artist who loves Sid's work. Working with the second artist will pay Sid less compared to the first one but Marcus Neuilth will surely win him fame. Sid finds the yearly salary thing amusing and he gets famous as a bonus so the offer doesn't sound bad to him. The maid starts to grind her chest against Sid's and recommends working for her family instead. Her family would pay Sid way too less but she reassures him that she talked to his father for an upgrade. A royal guard was watching the two from the back and seeing them together was making the man really mad. Maid Margaret doesn't stop talking and it is getting really annoying at this point. Sid is starting to get tired of her too and says Master Sharon wouldn't allow him to do any of that. The maid holds his hand and tells him not to worry about the lady at all. Sid struggles to get his hand out of Margaret's but succeeds at the last. Sid then asks the girl if she was Princess Rose's maid. That makes the maid a little upset and gets disappointed in Sid for having any kind of interest in Princess Rose. The maid mentions that she hates the princess but it was never like this before. She used to find the princess really kind but after what she did, the kingdom went into ruins and nothing's the same. The maid girl still demands attention from the guy by using Princess Rose's situation. She first says that she can't help Sid with that information but then begs him to ask for even a little hint. Sid, like the cunning fox he is, figures out what the maid was trying to do with all that sympathy. The maid was trying to get him into her religion but the guy escaped before she could. Sid was going to escape the garden when a guard stopped him. When Sid asks who that fat dude was, he gets offended saying it's impossible for a pianist to not recognize a garden guard. The dude seems to have some nuts in his head loose and keeps on saying some baffling stuff, full of insecurity. This man keeps hovering over Sid like the maid, but in a more aggressive way. Sid just keeps saying sorry, offending the guy even more. The guard then screams how he and little Maggie are in love with each other. Sid was confused and the man starts to describe his delusional love story. The one clearly hated seeing the man but he was too delusional to notice. The guard keeps up with his crap while Sid escapes. Sid blames all of that weird behavior on religion and rightfully so. Then we see Princess Rose talking about the kingdom and her mother. Shadow Garden was after her and she won't get a second chance now that she's a betrayer to them. The cult of Diablos will add to her stress and her kingdom will vanish one day. The princess notices Sid climbing over the wall and opens the window to run and hug the guy like she'd been missing him only. Sid missed her too and was there to inform her about something. 
Then we see the two sitting together holding hands, and Sid tells the princess that he snuck in as a pianist for her, upon her asking. That surprises her and Sid wanted to talk to her about her marriage while snacking on the biscuits. The princess refuses to say anything and says she is going to marry Duke no matter what. Sid says that's not possible in a very dramatic way then grabs a biscuit again. Rose cuts him off and begs him to not talk about that day. She asks him to not think about her, like the dude ever cared. Sid squeezes her hand and says they're the same. He emphasizes on the fact that the princess chose to be a dark knight despite her kingdom hating the fencers. Sid tries to validate the princess's feelings of loneliness and says he has been the same. No one understood Sid's dream either so he could feel Rose's pain on a closer level. Rose gets emotional and promises she would understand Sid's dream even if no one else does. Sid then says how the world keeps rejecting his ideals and calls him stupid. Rose is at the verge of crying and says she doesn't care what the world thinks. Sid's dream is the only thing she cares for and the guy holds her face and tells her that she's perverting her way of life after all the sacrifices. That upsets Rose and Sid tells her that he says so because she stabbed her fiance and then went on to murder her own father. He says he can understand why she did what she did but he can't understand why Rose is choosing to do something that contradicts her ideals. Sid wants to prevent the marriage from happening and says Rose is wrong for marrying the person she harmed. He says it's wrong to give up now and Rose gets up, saying she's got nothing else to say to Sid and tells him to forget her. Then we're brought to Rose talking to her fiance in the dark. The man says he could hear the voices coming from a specific area in her room, but Rose keeps denying. Duke could tell Rose had been crying and touched her face. Rose tells him to avoid touching her and the man grabs her from her neck and threatens her using the queen's name. Rose gives in and Duke throws her on the floor saying they have a wedding to plan. Sid is sitting out with biscuits still in his hand. He plans to use another tactic since the first one didn't work. He then pulls out the ring he stole from Duke Perv's pocket and leaves. Then we see two shadows talking about disposing of number 666 Akka the princess. One of the girls thinks it's too soon to decide Rose's fate despite the fact she was too careless with her actions. Epsilon plans to downgrade the rank of Victoria if she disappoints her. She then says they were at fault for not telling Rose about her mother earlier. They had no idea that the queen would be brought into the first ruins and Epsilon thinks that Seven Shadows were at fault for putting Rose and the queen in the same place. She mentions how no one wants Rose to find out about the matter yet. She then talks about Lord Shadow meeting Princess Rose. Epsilon believes that Sid is either after something else or waiting to see what Rose does since he didn't punish the princess. She believes that Sid's plans are to be relied upon and he's the only one who can view the world from a different yet lonely point of view. The lonely man we're talking about takes off his clothes and hops in to take a long, warm shower. His plans are beyond anyone's understanding, but they want him to resolve the problem with number 666 nonetheless. Epsilon then talks about the rings that were found at the ruins. If royals are pressurized enough, they might be compelled to use the key. She says if all the old tales are true, then the kingdom will turn into nothing but dirt and rocks, like others in the past. Epsilon continues to talk about the Black Rose which was used to wipe out 10,000 of Velgalton troops. The Black Rose will now be used to vanish the Oriana Kingdom so they need to be careful. As she was about to talk about the key, Sid pops out of his shower and Epsilon brings him a coffee. Sid compliments Epsilon for that. Later, she begins to massage Sid's shoulders while Victoria grabs the fruits for him. Sid brings up the good old days when Etta decided to try a new massager on Beta, making her scream in pain. Till then, Victoria brings him fruits and admires Sid silently, and the guy tells Epsilon that the thing they were worried about will be taken care of quickly. Epsilon is surprised to hear that since it was only Sid's first day as an undercover agent in the kingdom. Sid then decides to brag about it a little saying that the issue has almost been resolved and it was left hands play for him. Victoria is really impressed with Sid's cockiness and then we see a man demanding reports on the progress from Duke Perv. Duke tells Sir Mordred that everything is being taken care of well. Mordred brings up the Black Rose and says they'll become unstoppable if they gain control over it again. He tells Duke to be careful because there's still some people who can potentially cause problems. Duke reassures the man and Mordred says that Duke will be given a seat in rounds when they succeed in their plans. Mordred tells Duke to avoid making any mistakes before his marriage and their conversation ends there. Duke changes his tone not long after saying the key, the kingdom, and Princess Rose are all in his hands. He looks out the window calling Shadow Garden out for being losers. 
Then a woman is heard calling for Duke outside, and he leaves the room after throwing a tantrum about how incurable women are. Duke Gashat will accompany the lonely woman and another battle awaits the kingdom.